that's what you told me last time. Oh, okay. Okay. Now let me. Uh, uh, do I have to turn on the sharing screen? I think I have to turn on the screen sharing, right? Um, I have to turn on, yes, share screen. Here we go. Do you see my screen? Yes, wonderful. Okay. okay. So my talk is called Confined Vortex Surface and Irreversibility. And reversibility is also an important part of the talk because I think uh, these extra conditions which I found explain the irreversibility of the turbulence uh, because Euler equation is reversible. However, these extra stability conditions which are dynamically obtained are irreversible. Uh, and that is where the time reversibility is, is um, arises. So, um, uh, so I'm going to talk about this confined vortex surface, which is called CVS no relation to pharmacy. This vortex surface satisfies stability conditions which we derive from Navier-Stokes equations. These conditions include the requirement that the tangent velocity gap is a null vector of the strain tensor, is an annihilated strain tensor. Another requirement is the negative normal component of the strain. So these are two requirements. The entropy is conserved in the turbulence limit in the Navier-Stokes equations on these vortex surfaces. And that I think is a very important statement. Uh, I will discuss it in detail. Excuse we'll find uh, and investigate. Uh, what is the definition of entropy? It's integral of square of vorticity. Okay, thank you. So the derivative of that dynamically on the Navier-Stokes equation is not zero. However, on this extra conditions, uh, which I impose for the different reason, it is zero, exactly cancels. There are two terms which is vortex stretching and diffusion, and they exactly cancel on, on my, uh, with my boundary condition. Um, what two so, things cancel? Excuse me, what two things cancel? Uh, well, Navier-Stokes equation for vorticity have two terms, three terms. There's advection term, uh, V grad uh, omega, there is a vortex stretching term, omega grad V, and then there is diffusion term, mu Laplace and omega. So these three terms cancel. The first one, that direction simply reduce total derivative in the entropy that it doesn't count. The, uh, the mm. vortex stretching is an important term. And when you look in the literature, they say, oh, unfortunately, entropy is not conserved because of vortex stretching. That's true. But it exactly cancels uh, on these surfaces with the third term, which is diffusion. And that's what I'm going to describe. And that's very nice because if we believe in Kolmogoro theory, we would really want the energy dissipation to be a constant. If you want to declare it as a constant of motion which enters your equation, you better check that time derivative of this quantity is zero. And I see now that it is indeed zero. Uh, so the background strain, uh, that's another part of my talk, represents a Gaussian random matrix which leads to calculable distribution of entropy and other observables. So let me start. For the last 180 years, I checked, it's not 200, it's 180. 180 years, people are trying to solve a simple set of equations. Everybody knows these equations. Time derivative of V plus V grade V, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and last one is incompressibility equation. Uh, the only parameter is the viscosity, which should tend to zero while keeping finite dissipation of energy. So the dissipation of energy is viscosity times integral of omega squared. And that integral is called uh, entropy. And vorticity is curl of velocity. Uh, we shall call this limit turbulent limit. So when you tend viscosity to zero, but try to keep the dissipation constant, that, that's my definition of turbulent limit. So the fact that you need to solve equation in the limit of the parameter going to zero, it's like, uh, Solving Schrodinger equation is the limit of Planck's constant going to zero. That looks like a classical theory, but there are some details. There are some interesting cases when it's not quite true. Um, and that's the same thing here. So the fact that we need to take that limit makes this problem universal and centralizingly simple. We all know 
what happens in turbulence field. But we don't know how to explain this and how to describe it quantitatively. Instead of unique solution, depending on initial data or some unique fixed point, we have a fixed manifold, statistical distribution of vorticity structures with some universal property. So uh, solution is a fixed point, but that fixed point is multidimensional. And we don't know the nature of that fixed point. We don't know how to derive it. And that will be the attempt which I'm going to. So this fixed manifold you're referring to, that's in the space of uh, possible fluids? Or is it in the in the? No, no, no. It, it's space of parameters. There is a multi-parameter solution uh, of the Navier-Stokes yes, equation. And uh, uh, if you start with some initial condition after a large, long time, you will approach that manifold and start going around that manifold like in ergodic theory, solution goes around the energy surface and covers it and gives, gets a, gives, gives distribution. So something like that happens in turbulence, but we don't know exactly what. So that is what I'm trying to find out. Uh, so we don't even know the physical origin of this distribution, not to mention its complexity and its multifractal properties, far more complex than conformal field theory. The conformal field theory is inapplicable here because of non-local effects. Conservation law, I call it conservation law, it is uh, incompressibility. Grad, um, diverge, uh, grad dot V equals zero, and the same is true for omega. That would require conformal dimensions equal to for both velocity and vorticity, which is impossible mathematically and wrong experimentally. So conformal field theory doesn't apply here. And the reason, of course, is there's incompressibility, and that incompressibility leads to non-local effects. Uh, pressure instantly is influenced all over the space uh, with local change of velocity. So if one takes a fresh look at the expression for energy dissipation, it becomes clear that vorticity omega should be singular in some regions of space to compensate for infinitesimal uh, viscosity in front. Remember, dissipation is nu times integral of omega squared. So we have to get one over nu somewhere to compensate that. And that's one of the important parts of the problem. It's called anomalous dissipation. You have to uh, uh, compensate that factor. And the only compensation could come from singular uh, solutions where omega is uh, going to infinity so that this integral gets factor one over viscosity. Such singularities are known to exist, in particular in liquid helium, where viscosity is zero. These are vortex lines and vortex surfaces. Uh, vortex lines have infinite velocity, but vortex surface, uh, but for the vortex surface, velocity is finite. Um, one can imagine smeared velocity continuity creating large vorticity such that its square would compensate small factor of viscosity in front. So at, at, at the vortex surface, velocity is finite, but it is discontinuous. And its derivative, which is vorticity, will be infinite. And that is what we need. We need infinity to compensate small uh, factor equals zero. As we shall shortly see, this is what happens. But there are some interesting details to work out. To give an idea how, to, how the vortex surface explains the dissipation, Let's consider local vicinity of some point x, y, zero on the vortex surface. So z is normal direction to the surface, and uh, we are studying the solution in the local vicinity of some point, assuming that um, uh, uh, element of the surface is just a plane, tangent plane to the surface. So then, obviously, the most important terms to, to balance are singular terms. And singular terms will involve derivatives with respect to normal direction. So there will be a singular term in a direction, uh, V do, uh, times derivative of tangent component with respect to Z, because we know there is this continuity. So there is a large derivative here. And then there is another term, which is second derivative times new. And uh, that, of course, is very easy to solve, because you could introduce new variable dz v, and that will be just first order equation. And solution is well known. It's a Gaussian. So vorticity, which is derivative of velocity, uh, will be normal distribution. And normal distribution is uh, exponential with some factor in front. And velocity will be uh, equal to some constant, which is vector constant, which is uh, discontinuity times error function. So error function is a function which derivative equals uh, the Gaussian. 
and uh, the error function interpolates between minus one and one. Mm, so that's, uh, that's the smoothing of the discontinuity. So it's finite. At finite viscosity, we have smooth solution everywhere, and it has a form of error function, and vorticity has a form of the Gaussian. And the interesting detail is that this width of the Gaussian is uh, proportional to square root of the ratio of viscosity to the normal component of velocity. This is element of the strain. The matrix of derivatives of velocity is called strain, and this is normal strain. So solution only exists if normal strain is negative. And the physical meaning of that negative normal strain is obvious. Uh, the normal negative normal strain means that velocity uh, is just coming to the surface on both sides. It's kind of uh, flowing there, and then tangent discontinuity lets that flow go sideways, but uh, it, it's kind of pushing, <laughs> it keeps pushing. If you consider small movement of the surface, like Lagrange equation, you'll find out that if you move the surface a little bit, then the velocity will be moving it back because velocity on both sides of the surface, if you slightly uh, move outside, will be negative. It will direct to the surface. So it will be stable equation classically. And there will be no kelvin helm goals instability in that case. Uh, it's not quite so true, simple, it's slightly more complicated, but at least this solution, the Gaussian solution found by Burgers and Townsend was proven to be stable. It is, if you consider a full equation uh, with time derivatives and add, add other terms which I neglected here, you'll find out this solution is stable and uh, in all respects, it's finite. It, it's finite. Now, Who's the other this, author you're saying, Burgers and who? Townsend. Actually, it was discovered by Burgers in 48, but then later Townsend kind of ignored or didn't notice, I don't know what, he rediscovered it. And he went further because Burgers in 48 was mostly considering the circular uh, uh, vorticity, circular solution. Uh, and then he also considered the planar solution, but he didn't like it because in that planar solution, the dissipation uh, was not fine. It was not, there was no, there was unpleasant property that, um, you know, viscosity, the, this, uh, uh, this uh, integra integral of new omega squared was not quite finite number in the limit of zero viscosity. There was this factor of square root of new and that uh, disappointed Burgers and he never really, uh, um, he published that somewhere, but never talked about that because he wanted complete solution and it was not complete solution. Could, could you comment on uh, what you said about stability? In, in what sense is this stable? Uh, well, first of all, if you consider Lagrange equation, you consider the equation dr dt equals v of r, okay? Just in, in your mental uh, uh, image. Very simple equation. There is a z component, so dz dt equals v of z, and v of z is uh, 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 this constant times z. So you have equation dz dt equals this uh, <laughs> thing times z. And that everybody knows such an equation is stable. It exponentially goes to zero. dz dt equals minus az. Everybody knows that that equation is stable. So, so you're talking about the behavior of trajectories in this solution. I'm talking about the, the surface itself. The surface itself in Lagrange dynamics also moves in the local uh, velocity. But, but you're not talking about perturbations of this solution under the fluid evolution. I'm talking about perturbation of this solution in the fluid evolution. And that evolution has a form of Lagrange equation, d r d t equals v of r. Every point, including the surface, as a part of evolution with time moves with local velocity. That's the Euler equation. Right, the this, yes? Yeah. The, this structure is broken for perturbations, right? So you, you want to say that, uh, I mean, a perturbation of this exact solution is stable for the full equation, then this particular structure of the solution is broken yes. for the perturbation. Yes, I, I will, uh, I will describe that in more detail uh, uh, slightly later. I will talk about that same stuff, how that is stable, because it was studied recently in greater detail in more general case. 
So let me just proceed and I will answer this question. So uh, if you consider the square, um, entropy will involve the square of this Gaussian function. Now the square of the Gaussian is also the Gaussian, but then there are the extra factor because the um, factor in front of the Gaussian is also squared and that was only balancing the original Gaussian. The square of Gaussian have extra factor and that factor becomes square root of vorticity. Uh, and uh, interesting thing is that there is also this factor, square root of normal strain. Mm, so there will be, uh, in the entropy, there will be some factor in front, there will be square root of strain, and then there will be square root of the discontinuity of velocity. So once you integrate that in the limit of small width, you'll get very nice and beautiful expression uh, for the, and I believe, Nobody wrote that expression before. Uh, I wrote that like a year ago. That dissipation in that limit is uh, integral of square of mm, velocity discontinuity times square root of the strain. So that's exact formula in a sense that uh, uh, that uh, I. In this integral, I took the limit of the viscosity equal to zero. So there is also this factor which will have to be compensated somehow, but, uh, but I ignored all corrections uh, coming from the finite width of the Gaussian to this integral. So integral over volume reduced to the integral over the surface. And the, in, the quantity which I'm integrating is square of, of discontinuity times square, uh, times square root of strain. Now, uh, in the same way, we could compute the next derivative, right? We found the derivative of energy, and that derivative of energy is, is called epsilon, dissipation. Now we could find derivative of dissipation, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, definition of, of dissipation, where is it in the beginning? Um, it, is in, it is viscosity times entropy. So you could Find, uh, you could find time derivative of that with respect to uh, Navier Stokes, and you will get something. You will get omega dot omega, and you could look at every term, and then you could compute the, these terms. Here's the equation. You have to use this Navier Stokes equation, time derivative of omega. There will be this, uh, you know. Uh, this is a deduction term, this is vortex stretching term, this is the viscosity term, they all add up. And in the end, when you compute all that in the limit of this uh, uh, singular vorticity near the surface, you'll get another surface integral. And that surface integral will have very interesting structure. It will have strain sandwiched between the velocity discontinuity. So this thing will have strain times velocity discontinuity. Now, if you look at the solution found by Burgers and Townsend, that is zero, because it turns out that there is no strain in the direction of velocity discontinuity for that solution. So solution is very special. Mm, it's not the most generic solution. The strain is very peculiar. And they, could found, they found that nice Gaussian solution only for the case when strain is not Full tensor, it's only have components in other directions, but no component of the strain in direction of the velocity discontinuity. And then under this condition, indeed, oh, miracle, time derivative of uh, time derivative of the entropy is zero, which is in a retrospect very nice because that epsilon is supposed to be the main constant involved in the whole turbulence theory. If there is a constant in your theory, you better check that it is constant. And until now, all the attempts to compute the derivative of the entropy led to non-zero. And people were very, very upset about that. That's kind of closet, uh, skeleton in the closet of Kolmogorov theory. They call it constant, but you can prove it's constant. Now we see it's not identically constant. It's constant because the, in the limit of, of at least in the limit of the turbulence limit, it turns out that the strain is orthogonal to velocity uh, discontinuity on the surface, and that's why it is zero.
I would like to hear questions about because this is a controversial statement uh, and experts should jump on me saying, no, no, you are wrong. It's not zero or maybe it's okay. It's not zero. I don't know. But, but I would expect experts to be uh, uh, very much excited and unhappy about me saying something which they thought is non-zero is zero. Okay, yeah. So maybe I could just ask some clarifying questions. So, um, so in the Kolmogorov theory, the epsilon um, sort of understood to be statistically a constant in a stationary state. So it's, it's average yeah. maybe constant if it's held there in a statistically stationary state. But of course, I mean, for example, for the Burgers equation where you can work out analytical formulas for the dissipation due to shocks, there it's a decaying function of time, right? So the if, for, if, if the Burgers equation is not held in some sort of statistical steady state, then you have a singular structure. It produces anomalous dissipation because of the velocity roughness, but then the dissipation decays proportional to the size of the jump of the shock. So Great. here you have an example, I guess, of uh, um, a, a, an exact stationary solution for Navier-Stokes, I guess not infinite, ener I, sorry, not finite, energy, right? Because it goes out. Energy it could be infinite, yes. It is yeah. leaking and leaking and there's infinite supply, but the right. dissipation rate must be finite. And that's right. indeed the case, but it's not always the case. My surfaces are analogs of Burgers shocks. Uh, one dimensional version of my surface would be exactly the Burgers shock. And uh, mm, what I'm trying to say is that these uh, surfaces, which are analogs of Burgers shocks, are such that, uh, 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 and that only is possible in three dimensions, it's impossible in one dimension, uh, because there is no direction <laughs> in, in one dimension. So in, in three dimensions, the solution is such that uh, though it is some quadratic form of the shock velocity, like in this case, it's specifically the general quadratic form. I see. So, so in the Berger's analogy, I guess uh, the relevant thing to think about would be um, a shock that's held uh, with constant values at infinity, say like zero, or sorry, one at negative infinity, zero at positive infinity, it could be held stationary, in which case there is a dissipation associated to the shock discontinuity, which might be at zero, but it's pulling energy from infinity. That's why it's allowed to be a stationary. Yeah, but solution. here it is better because it is stable at every point on the surface. It's not like compensation between infinity and, and the local point. It's it's local. It is it. This derivative is local at every point in the surface. It's well, not, the it's, dissipation of the Burger shock is also local. I mean, it's just at the shock itself. But the reason why the solution is stationary is because it's pulling energy from infinity. Okay. Yeah, you could put it this way. Of course, by definition, on every station the solution of Navier-Stokes, time derivative uh, should be zero by definition. But nobody knows those stationary solutions. What I'm trying to say is here is an example of the stationary solution and uh, stationary solution which is stable. And that is this stable vortex surface satisfying these conditions. And I see that it all matches. Uh, the same condition which uh, made the Burgers solution, uh, uh, I mean the Burgers uh, vortex sheet stable, that same condition leads to conservation of mm, entropy. Maybe, maybe just one further remark. So um, there, there's some work done by uh, Roman Shvidkoi, who's a, a mathematician working in this general area, where, where he shows that um, if you have a smooth vortex sheet, so, um, but in the dynamical problem, so it's not, so, so in particular, a finite ener energy solution, in this case of the ideal fluid of Euler, and you have a smooth vortex sheet that evolves um, then it cannot sustain anomalous dissipation. Um, the singularity is not strong enough to actually, so it would conserve energy in that case. So here, but, I guess- but, the but, distinction... but it's different, it's different. This thing comes because of cancellation of this vortex stretching and diffusion. It's not Euler conservation law. I'm talking about Navier-Stokes conservation law. This time derivative, this term, which is, Navier stock and this term, which is Euler, both contributed and canceled each other. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But in the limit of zero viscosity, as Dennis said in the beginning, 
you can think of the limit of your solution as a singular Euler solution um, with a sheet extending to infinity. But there, what I'm saying is that as a singular Euler solution, um, if it weren't, if it were finite energy, then it couldn't sustain anomalous dissipation. That's right. That's right. And it's not. And it's not. And it's not. And what I'm trying to say is that from the point of view of Euler equation, which you neglect or neglect that term, it is indeed a particular solution of Euler equation, but the solution with certain boundary conditions, which was never used in Euler equation. With that boundary condition, indeed, you could forget about everything and just say time derivative is zero because it's safe. But otherwise, it will not be zero. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now, uh, this is this. So I take this condition, I call it CVS, confined vortex sources, so that the strain annihilates the normal, uh, the strain annihilates the tangent velocity. And I'm very happy that such a simple equation with just three letters uh, will, as you shall see, have a lot of consequences. So this is the boundary condition which should be added to the Euler equation. Excuse me, can you clarify what delta V bar T means, that term? Uh, delta V is velocity on one side of the sheet minus velocity on another side of the sheet. And the subscript T means that that difference is only directed tangentially to the surface because the normal components are contingent. So delta means difference between the two sides. And T is just a reminder that this difference is uh, 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 orthogonal to the normal. And, and S is the strain, which means, how do you write the S? Okay. S is the uh, one half of the Hessian above uh, plus one half of the Hessian inside. Both above and below the surface, on two sides of the surface, the flow is potential, there is no vorticity, and therefore the uh, uh, derivative velocity is the Hessian of the potential. So S here is, is average, one half of the value of the on one and other side, because they are different. Okay, thank you. It's principal value. Uh, so uh, recently, now we're going to give, give you some more details. Recently, we have found the solution of Navier-Stokes equation in a plane with arbitrary background strain. So uh, Burgers actually only solved his equation when it had nice solutions simple Gaussian solution. He deliberately took a uh, very specific uh, value of the background strain, in which case solution was so simple. And I found the most general solution. And then uh, uh, Sharif, uh, Karim Sharif and his collaborator uh, in that work uh, found, uh, just realized that my solution means, uh, I call the asymmetric water sheet, my generic solution of Navier stock means that the solution it can be interpreted as solution in arbitrary strain. And they studied solution with arbitrary background strain and found very interesting picture. Uh, in general, there are three eigenvalues of the strain adding up to zero. So we'll call them lambda one, lambda two, and the third one is minus sum of the two. Now, uh, Townsend corresponds to lambda two equals zero. I mean, Burgers Townsend corresponds to lambda two equals zero. And they studied specifically what happens with positive or negative lambda two when it is non-zero. And here's what happens. The burgers is lambda two equals zero. In that case, it's a stable Gaussian solution, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what happens. Uh, that's the, uh, on the X axis is Z, the normal direction. So that's the profile of particity as a function of the normal coordinate. So this uh, orange curve is, is Townsend or burgers. It's a simple, pure Gaussian symmetric on both sides. Now, uh, if the second eigenvalue of strain is not zero, then there are two possibilities. One is the one which I found, uh, which was this, which is a Gaussian on one side, but the power like on another side. And technically it is some uh, crazy special function, uh, which is Hermit polynomial of negative fractional index. But that Hermit polynomial of negative fractional index, which is hypergeometric function, that has that property. On one direction is Gaussian, on another it is the power. And in case of when lambda two, so that is lambda two equals like one half 
of the of the of the one. Now, if it is negative, uh, then it is still not good. It, it is Gaussian, then it becomes negative, but then it goes to zero as a power uh, from another side. So in both cases, positive or negative lambda two, we have uh, what we call, can call leaking of vorticity. Instead of being confined to this uh, uh, Gaussian uh, shrinking Gaussian, it has one side tail, which is power-like, which means that the vorticity leaks from under that tail. And therefore, if you study the time dependent of that solution, I'm sorry, uh, if you say study the time dependence, you indeed find that this all both of these solutions are unstable. The, the, if you find if you add time derivative to Navier Stokes and try to see what happens with that solution with time, so the Burger Townsend stays the same, nothing happens. But in case of these two, in one case it just decays to zero, and in another case it blows up and and uh, goes to infinity, which means that the approximation becomes non true. So either it's unstable or it is decaying, but it's not finite and stable, like it is in case of the Burgers and Townsend. Now, here is experimental data. In that paper uh, by Sharif, and I keep forgetting his collaborator's name, he, I forgot, uh, Insignia or something like that. So that is the result of the mm, numerical simulation. Not very large Reynolds number, but you see this yellow uh, 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 stick, which is a profile, which is this Gaussian profile. So Z normal coordinate is this direction. And you see that indeed there is a mm, nice, uh, 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 well, you know, defined thin surface, which is stable. Mm, um, but of course, it has only finite size. Uh, so the surface is the orange color. Yes. Well, the surface. If you look at this orange color from the mile well, mile ahead, it will be like thin line. So the yes, the surface is the is represented by the orange orange count. Orange is a region of large vorticity, and blue is a region of small vorticity. So you see that indeed there is something like this. Mm, well-defined water sheet. Now, if indeed uh, the entropy is conserved. Excuse me. So the normal component there is perpendicular to the orange. What, what do you mean? More, no, yes, the, uh, the z dire the normal direction is z, z. Normal direction is horizontal here. And vertical is the x direction. No, but the surface uh, curves around. It's a circle, right? That's the cross section of the surface. No, no, no. The surface is an imaginary vertical line. There's another coordinate which goes in to the perpendicular direction. So on the x axis is the normal to the surface. This is a cross section of the surface. What is a cross axis? Okay. Z is horizontal x. X is vertical axis. And then there's a third axis, uh, uh, y. Okay. So the surface is in the x, y plane. What we see is a cross section of that surface. We cut this surface to see, to show how vertice depends on normal direction to the surface. So this yellow thing is a cut surface. You should imagine that surface extending in both directions to your to you and deep inside the screen. I'm totally confused. Okay. So if I rotate the 90 degrees, it will be probably clearer. So that Z will go up. Oh, Z goes. Look, I'm a topologist. You've got a surface in three space. Where the hell is it? Oh, it's the thickened surface. Because my screen is two dimensional. If I would be showing that in mathematics, I would show you the surface in three dimensions, but they gave me the picture in two dimensions. Well, describe it. I mean, God. Okay. The damn topologist, I understand, but don't use Okay. The so imagine this I'll yellow stick. In the picture. Where's the okay. Surface? Imagine this yellow stick having another dimension perpendicular to the screen, and that is the Y dimension. Vertical direction Where is, is X. The surface? I don't see it. 
where's the surface? You said it was orange. If you if you take if you the surface is cut, the surface is going perpendicular to the screen. Fine. Uh, okay. And what's the intersection with the screen? It's a cross section of the surface. What does it look like in that picture? What which part of the picture is it? It's a line in the middle of the yellow section. No, that's not a surface. An intersection of a surface with a Well, this is not a closed surface. surface. It's a piece of the surface. The intersection of a surface with a transversal plane is a curve. Closed curve. Where's that closed curve? This curve multiplied by in by the the next coordinate is a surface, okay? What's the curve? Which curve is it? It is a piece of the curve. This yellow stick is a part of the surface. It, it is not extending to infinity as we would want it to be. It's a, it's a part of the, uh, of the surface. The surface has boundaries. It is not the boundary of the surface. The surface goes uh, 20 miles up on your direction and 20 miles down. The surface is perpendicular to the screen. If it's a surface, it intersects the screen in a closed curve. Because it's, the surface, but it, is it, there in real the world, it's not the surface; it's a piece of the surface. Is the surface filled, or is it? Are you just talking about the skin, or, you, or is there stuff in the surface? Because this makes it look like it's like. Okay, so this is the end of the surface. This is the beginning of the surface. The surface has a topology of, if you want, the surface has a topology of. Uh, it's a surface with boundaries, okay? Imagine the square. So this is uh, uh, one end of the square, this is another end of the square, and square is perpendicular to the screen. Then it is the surface with boundaries. It's the surface which is equivalent to the square. I think you should go on. It's not infinite surface. It's, it's, finite, it's finite simulation. It's, it's experimental result. So there is no infinite surfaces in experimental result. It's just a piece of the surface. Can you imagine the square perpendicular to the screen such uh, that this yellow line will be the, the... Yes, okay. Then it's a surface with boundary, which you didn't... Yes, this yellow line is, is, is the boundary of the surface. But, but it's not really the boundary because it's, a, it's cut. So you should imagine that, the, that it is somewhere in the middle. The, the surface goes perpendicular to the screen in your direction and also perpendicular to the screen to another direction. Yeah, but that surface has boundary. Yes, as everything has in the real world. And this horizontal direction is normal to the surface. So it's a surface with boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, of course, Burgers and Townsend considered infinite plane, but that's only the little piece of the plane. They considered infinite plane, but this is close enough because the, uh, the, the length of the plane in a vertical direction is like 10 times bigger than its thickness in the horizontal, so it's good approximation to the plane. Shall I proceed? Please. So if this integral uh, is a motion constant, then you could say, here is the project of the mm, turbulence statistic. You should sum over all possible mm, solutions of this extra equation, CVS, this one. You should sum over all possible solutions, and I will describe these solutions. And then uh, such sum will be satisfied. It will be like Gibbs distribution, because if this is an integral of motion like Hamiltonian in the Gibbs theory, then sum over all possible solutions need to be specified what is the sum or solution, what are their parameters. But that would be the project um, for the turbulent statistics. because it will satisfy the conditions of Liouville theorem. Uh, it will be time derivative if you find 
invariant measure, conserved invariant measure on these solutions, then this uh, would be the project for the turbulent statistics. Uh, but it's too early to say, uh, discuss it now because later I will go in details and, and specify what does it mean because then I will explicitly parameterize the surface by some parameters. Uh, then it will be, then we'll come back to this uh, uh, formula. So, so Sasha, can I ask this, this question? Yeah, sure. So before when you were talking, I was thinking the surface didn't have boundary and you were giving you know, a picture on the two sides of the surface and so on. Yes, you're right. That's what I'm going to consider. But right. in so reality, we don't wait, see wait, such wait. surface. I didn't get to the period. I didn't get to the period. Okay. Okay. So that was a picture. That picture made perfectly good sense on the interior of the surface, but it doesn't make sense anymore near the boundary of the surface. Boundaries are singularities. Uh, in, in the naive talks, there are no singularities, but if the surface has boundaries, those boundaries will be singular points where vorticity has singularity. Uh, uh, I'm not discussing it now. There are certain topological solutions, very interesting, which I discussed in another paper, which are describing such a, a, a surface with a boundary. Uh, and in, in terms of the, there are so-called, mm, uh, in terms of the, so-called uh, collapse variables. Uh, this is discontinuity of collapse variables. Such a surface will be, uh, can be described by certain discontinuity of collapse variables like domain wall. And uh, mm, uh, I don't want to go into these details because I'm now considering much simpler case of closed surfaces where everything can be solved exactly. Okay, thank you. If, if we could discuss that because that is a very interesting topological thing, it's called it was something studied in, in, in the cosmological strings called uh, domain walls, at least Alice uh, string. There are lots of interesting things about that and they exist in liquid helium, but I'm not going to discuss it today. So please let me proceed. Yeah. But you're right. Of course, I'm interested in closed surfaces because otherwise there is no, you can't introduce potential flow on one and another side because they are topologically uh, not separated, and, and uh, it's totally different situation, I agree. But I'm going to consider the topologically clean situation when there are two distinct regions. Okay. okay, let me now describe this solution. I will skip words and go back, go to the formulas. So, Let's imagine that there is a closed surface separating two regions of space, inside and outside. Uh, and uh, there are two potentials, one outside the surface, another inside the surface. And uh, these potentials will satisfy Laplace equation because the velocity is incompressible. And basically we could solve everything uh, in each of these domains, uh, like for example, the pressure is given by so-called Bernoulli formula. So once we know the potential, uh, we know everything. Uh, and uh, the potential in that particular case is not completely defined because all you have is the, is the uh, Neumann boundary condition on that surface. That normal derivative of phi plus equals normal derivative of phi minus. That's not enough to determine both. Mm. And uh, that, something is missing here. And that missing part is the CVS condition. So if you consider the difference between potentials on one and another side, so the derivative, normal derivative is continuous, but the potential itself is not. So there is a difference between them. And that difference, mm, I call it gamma and velocity, Discontinuity velocity is gradient of that gamma. And because the potential uh, uh, normal derivative is zero, that's why this gradient is uh, tangential to the surface. So let me present my solution. It has a form of parameterization of the complex velocity field in the complex XY plane. So I'm considering cylindrical 
um, frame. There is X, Y, and Z. And my solution depends on Z in a very trivial way. Uh, only non-singular part of the velocity depends um, on the on Z. And here is how it looks. So the Z component of velocity is just some constant times Z. And X and Y components are, again, some linear parts. So this part is a solution with finite strain, which is all the solution of Laplace equation. Uh, but then there is non-trivial part. Um, and it is parameterized by some mapping of the unit circle in parameter space. Psi is a complex plane, and this solution, so psi equal one, uh, absolute value, so the unit circle is mapped to the boundary of my surface by some conformal map called C of psi. And outside, the velocity has this function V, and inside, it's just linear uh, uh, velocity. Uh, corresponding to constant strain. So this V of psi is non-trivial thing. Uh, 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 so the potential is corresponding to this quadratic form uh, inside and outside, but outside there's also some uh, real part of some holomorphic function of this C of psi. So this is um, potential as a function of coordinate and coordinate is mapped. Um, remember the coordinate is mapped from the complex plane of psi into physical space. So there's this function C which maps uh, the unit, the outside of unit circle into the outside of the uh, of our space. And the uh, potential is the real part. And the complex velocity is just the derivative of this complex function. Now, uh, uh, the Norman boundary condition is a very simple thing. I think it was known for 100 years, so that Neumann boundary condition can be simply expressed in the formula uh, as follows. Real part of psi df d psi um, equals zero. And that is, it has a very well-known solution uh, that this function f is logarithm of psi. So as a function of psi, it is trivial. It is a logarithm psi, and that, of course, is solution, but there is unknown conformal map. So, uh, so if we know conformal map, then we in fact know everything. In particular, uh, we know a velocity field because velocity field will be, uh, uh, here, uh, velocity field will be, here's complex velocity field. It will be derivative of this complex function with respect to psi. And it will, of course will involve this unknown conformal map. So from the point of view of Euler, conformal mapping is arbitrary. It satisfies the Laplace equation outside for a bitter shape of the vortex surface. So Euler will tell us, okay, fine, you solved Neumann boundary conditions, so your solution is our bitter shape of the mm, vortex surface, and for every shape you solve Euler equations in a weak sense. But I'm saying that not every uh, uh, such solution is stable, and the stability condition is this, uh, uh, they call CVS condition. So this CVS condition has the following form. If you look at the, if you take, uh, this is the CVS condition. If you take the strain, if you compute the strain in terms of velocity and its derivative and multiply it by tangent discontinuity of velocity and write that in terms of complex one complex equation, it will be this simple equation. And uh, so differential means differential along the, this equation is only valid on the unit circle. It's the boundary condition. So differential is the differential of the function defined on the unit circle. So this lower condition is the condition following from Neumann boundary conditions because uh, VDC is derivative of the potential and that is, uh, and potential is gamma times angle on a circle. So that is trivial condition, that's Neumann. And this is CVS. So upper limit is extra boundary condition, which we add to the Euler equation to completely specify solution. And that's a stability condition, that, uh, that, uh, that strain dot velocity gap equals zero. So if you write that in terms of complex velocity, in terms of complex function F, V, you will get this. 
Yeah, just want to stop here and hear some questions because maybe there are some things which you don't quite understand. I can show you quickly the mathematical notebook where I derived this equation. It's very simple to derive it. Would you like to see it? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to understand it. I don't want to, I don't want to see algebraic manipulations. I want to see so the conformal map. You're saying given any region, you have a conformal mapping. And yes. B is, relate, B is related to the conformal mapping, how? Yes, C is conformal mapping. So V, D, C is a differential uh, of angle on the circle. So okay. that follows from the boundary condition that V is inversely proportional to derivative of the conformal mapping. And then where's the strain? Here. I want to show you the strain. Strain involves second derivatives of velocity. Uh, first derivatives of velocity. Strain involves, uh, yes, strain involves first derivatives of velocity. So this is, so there are two terms in the strain and uh, uh, the terms with derivative velocity is this term and other terms are these terms. I think it will be really helpful if you give me two minutes. It's very easy to show. I, I will start with conventional formula from strain and then I will show you. And that's nice because it's mathematical notebook. You could um, actually uh, see um, a lot of things. So here it is. Um, uh, let me get, make it bigger. Do you see it now? Yeah. Okay, so, so there is my potential, phi, which is real part of function of complex variable, okay? Now, if you find uh, uh, the velocity, it will be a real part of F prime and real part of df dy. So in terms of F prime, it will be a real part and minus imaginary part of the complex derivative of velocity. That's, a, that's what follows from this formula. And this will be discontinuity because my potential is zero uh, inside, only outside it's non-trivial. So uh, uh, this discontinuity is in fact the velocity. Is in fact the velocity. Uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to say is that here is the two-dimensional vector of, of gradient of the uh, gradient gamma or velocity discontinuity. And that's the definition of the strain. I just could compute the strain in terms of the function G. G is uh, uh, one half uh, of the velocity outside and inside. So G two primes is equivalent to V prime. So that's the definition of the strain. And that is the strain. I add uh, uh, there is a regular part of the strain and then there is a singular part of the strain. So I add them together and I get this. This is a strain. And then I uh, simply take, multiply the strain times uh, the uh, discontinuity of velocity and then I simplify and I get exactly this formula. So F prime is V, that's conjugate of F prime and G, and G prime, G prime, G to G, I mean, G is also V, G, uh, G is also V, so uh, uh, G to prime is V prime. So that's the equation which you get if you take the strain and multiply by this continuity of velocity, very simple. And the Neumann boundary condition is this. So if you take this condition uh, and the Neumann boundary condition, you will get these two equations, the prime, the complex conjugate plus these two terms equals zero. Very simple. Do you, do you mind scrolling up to the top really quick, how F and G are defined? Uh, potential is real part of analytic function. Okay, and G is just, I don't, where's the definition of G here? 
uh, G is in this case, uh, same thing. G is one half F because in general, G is one half of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, velocity, um, uh, G is one half of potential uh, on one side plus another side. But in my case, on one side is zero. So that one half means that G equals one half uh, G equals one half uh, of V. Okay. So G is one half. So G is one half of F. Well, that's it. All right. So, so F prime is V, and G two prime is V prime. Yes. This is written in general case. F would mean uh, the gap between potentials, and G will be. Uh, symmetric sum, one half potential above and uh, below. But in one, in my solution, there's only potential above. So this one half of above and below equals one half of potential above. So G equals one half F. That's it. So once so, so this formula for the strain is just honest differentiation. It is mixed derivatives. When you take the complex uh, potential and find that this is this term is second derivative with respect to x. This is mixed derivative with respect to x and y. This is also mixed derivative with respect to x and y, and that is second derivative with respect to y. So that's the matrix. That's the Hessian. In case of holomorphic function, Hessian reduces to real and imaginary part of second derivative uh, of the holomorphic function. So once you do that and multiply that, you'll get very simple formula, which is this. Okay, got it. So there is, uh, uh, you know, it's something which could have been written 200 years ago. There is no nothing new. I mean, it's just nobody knew that uh, that only only solutions which are nullifying the strain are stable. And that's exactly what we need to have, have enough equation, you see? Uh, it is exactly what we need, where is my, where am I going? Your email. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hold on. Here we go. So, so this equation below is a Neumann boundary condition. It relates V, which is a gradient complex. It's a derivative of the potential. It relates V uh, to derivative of this complex map, V dc equals d theta. I mean, that is basically, if you divide dc d theta, dc d theta will be the normal, the tangential vector. So uh, you will get this um, Neumann boundary condition. So real part of V times tangential vector should be constant and that constant is called gamma. Because imaginary part should be zero. So that is the equation. And remarkable thing is that equation can be solved exactly. And here's how it can be solved. Um, if you want me to go into details, I would rather show you something else because from here, you could go to the equation, which, you know, I think if you give me some more minutes, I will show you how exactly it is solved. I have a, I have a, qu I have a sort of conceptual question about this. Okay. What, uh, this conformal mapping is in in is in a in a plane. Yes. What is that plane in terms of the geometry of the surface? Well, there is a Z, which is a cylinder. The third, uh, the uh, cylindrical coordinates have Z, X, and Y. Okay. So these are X and Y. So uh, uh, you should imagine that there is a surface which extends in the Z direction, and what working in the cross section of that surface in the plane X and Y. 
So whatever is outside the, uh, the contour C would be outside the surface because the surface is C multiplied by infinity in Z direction. So the surface is constant in the Z direction. So yes, yeah, surface is this loop moved in Z direction, yes. So velocity field depends on uh, on x, y, and z. The z component of a velocity field is z, and the rest of components of velocity field don't depend on z. See, z direct, uh, z component. Uh, so the the component in the direction of the of the tube is linearly dependent on z. And other components don't depend on z. They only depend on x and y. That's how we solve the problems with cylindrical symmetry. Things don't depend on z. So there is non-trivial dependence of the velocity field and potential uh, in terms of these coordinates x and y. And that is given by this continual mapping. So f is a trivial thing. f is just log c. So, but since there's some mapping involved inside, we don't really know c of psi. That's what we need to find. So, so F would be a logarithm of inverse map. If we would know how to map from psi to, to C, that would be solution, right? If we know inverse map to psi, we say, okay, F of X plus I Y equals log of inverse function. But we need to find the function uh, before we find the inverse function. Okay, I got the picture. Okay. So let me show you something else then, uh, because that may be very interesting. Uh, indeed, so let me uh, show you um, actual uh, equations which, um, which are solving. Um, Um, so the equations equations look as follows. If you look at the, if you look at the uh, of the equations, uh, they are solved as follows. So the equation for this is the equation which I derived. So these are the equations of which I derived. So the upper equation is the equation for uh, uh, this CVS from the strain. The lower equation is the Neumann boundary condition. And then it's very simple. You multiply the upper equation by V and use the lower equation and then you eliminate T. It's very simple. You multiply upper equation by V and say V dc equals this, and then you will get very simple equation here. Still looks horrible, cubic equation <laughs> involving complex and complex conjugates, but there is a hidden simplicity here. Namely, if we look at the equation for real and imaginary part, we still get uh, nonlinear equation, but if you take the ratio of these two equations, then you get very simple equation. You'll find that one of these components of U and V is, is a power of another. With some unknown coefficient and some very well known index, because index is related to these parameters of the strain, P and Q. So that's the, that's the aha moment. The linear equation suddenly became linear. This nonlinear boundary condition 
is a secret linear equation, which is this. However, this equation is not quite trivial because if you want u and v positive, that's a reasonable solution. But if say v is negative, that is complex, but they can be complex, they are both real. So uh, I can solve these equations separately in each uh, of the four sectors of the, of the complex plane. So when u and v are positive, it's this. Uh, when u and v, some of them is negative, it's absolute value because uh, uh, you know, the boundary function of the holomorphic function don't need to be holomorphic. So that could be separate pieces, and in each piece you will have different signs. And what we really need to have is you need the loop to match at the seams, because at every corner of the unit circle, the, the loop has to be continuous. It don't, couldn't, don't have to be differential, but it has to be closed. There should be no holes. So. Uh, so from this equation, you find the relation between u and v, then you go back here and you'll find theta, the angle on the unit surface, on the unit circle as a function of v. You can't find v, but you could find inverse function. So you find the theta angle as a function of v, because now you know u, you know v, you could integrate that equation, and uh, you find it, analytic formula. So you have inverse map in analytic form. Theta of v equals this formal, and parameters should be such that that uh, one end of the integral interval for between so v and uh, varies in some finite uh, region. So one end should go to to angle equal zero, another end should go to the angle equal pi over two, and that determines the coefficient here. The, this coefficient here is determined from this condition and is given by this formula. And from that formula, we see that the solution for the, uh, that this um, circulation gamma could only be positive. There is certain asymmetry in the solution, uh, which is related to the, um, you know, irreversibility. So it's not like every sign of uh, circulation is allowed, only positive sign. Mm. Now you could find the conformal map because you know that C uh, uh, equals, so C prime equals one over V. So C prime times V equals console. If you solve this equation, you'll find that C is integral to theta divided by V of theta and V is known. Again, you could integrate. Again, everything cancels, simplifies and you get simple analytic solution. If an exact formula for conformal map on the circle. So you, don't yet find the whole conformal map. You only find conformal map at the unit circle. But as we know for holomorphic function, if we know boundary value on the unit circle, we could reconstruct the whole function. And that's what I did. Mm. Uh, that's what I did. I just wrote the mm, Cauchy integral. And in this particular case, I should write Cauchy integral over the unit circle, but I shouldn't write it for the C because C grows at infinity. The boundary condition for this map is that infinity C should grow linearly so that spatial infinity corresponds to uh, infinity in terms of size uh, or equivalently velocity should decrease and velocity, uh, is, if, if psi grows linearly, then velocity decreases is one of our psi. So I take, C over psi squared, I assume that C grows linearly. This function therefore decreases. And therefore you could write down the Cauchy integral over the unit circle. And for decreasing function, that Cauchy integral uh, for the holomorphic function outside the circle uh, becomes uh, uh, the residue at this point uh, here. So that would be identity. So this identity involves the boundary value at the circle plus the knowledge of the behavior at infinity that at infinity C grows linearly and therefore uh, this thing mm, uh, uh, decreases and therefore you could extend the surface contour outside the unit circle and uh, it reduces to only one residue, uh, residue uh, this because C by hypothesis doesn't have singularities outside the unit circle. So that is therefore an identity. And uh, if you add all four pieces of the unit circle, you'll get uh, this integral. 
if you just add these boundary conditions all together and reduce in integration over angle to integration over this auxiliary parameter u, you will get explicit formula for the uh, loop psi of C. And, and velocity field is just related to derivative of this holomorphic function because that relation between V and Xi and C is valid everywhere in the Xi plane. That is definition. So the only unknown function Xi was determined by this Riemann-Hilbert problem, if you wish. And uh, that is explicit uh, uh, function with explicit algebraic uh, formulas. U is uh, power of V. So an omega is exponential i theta, and everything is well defined here. It's it's this integral is not a well known mm, uh, it's not a well known um, mm, special function, but it can be computed with arbitrary accuracy, like forty digits or, or sixty digits, uh, using Mathematica. And that's what we did. We used uh, the mm, Laurent expansion of this function to infinity. You could expand it in terms of uh, outside, I mean, outside the unit circle, you could expand it in inverse power of uh, psi, coordinate psi, and that expansion has the following form. It has some coefficients. And the beautiful thing is that this coefficient can be proven uh, to be bounded by a constant, independent of the number, which proves, therefore, that this is a, indeed a convergent expansion. So indeed, uh, this expansion, this formula for C of Xi uh, converges outside the unit circle in Xi plane. And <clears throat> you could actually prove it <laughs> because there is an equality that, uh, that uh, a real part of any complex number is less than absolute value. Uh, by absolute, absolute value of real is less than uh, absolute value and absolute value is just a constant. So there is no dependence of the order of the expansion. So that formula proves that, that this Laurent expansion is convergent and therefore there are no singularities. Uh, but then uh, we actually, uh, um, we actually, I used Mathematica what is it? Uh, to actually find the numerical solution. And here is most interesting part of this numerical solution which is, here is the shape of the contour. It depends on this parameter mu, which is the ratio of p plus q and p minus q. It doesn't change very much. It has four uh, themes, but other than that, it's smooth. And here is the complex plane. So this um, is a complex plane, complex side plane. This, uh, you know, Black line is a, is the image of the unit circle, and you see that all the singularities are inside or in the boundary of the unit circle. So on the right we have this conformal map C C of psi. So again, no singularities outside the unit circle. Plenty of singularities inside, but they don't count uh, because we are not using this function inside the unit circle. So this is a, a, a complex map of the function C of psi. And this is a complex map of the V of Xi. In both cases, there are no singularities outside, which kind of proves uh, the correctness of the mm, uh, solution. And uh, also, uh, you could see that indeed this function decreases to infinity. The, the vertical coordinate is absolute value, and the color is the phase. So the color goes 360 degrees, uh, and absolute value here in case of C uh, goes up and in case of the V it goes down because they are related. V is one over C, uh, C prime. So there is a lot of non-trivial calculations behind this formula because we had to compute uh, these Taylor coefficients, uh, uh, this uh, Laurent coefficients with many, many digits uh, and then use a uh, continued fraction because if you have Laurent expansion uh, for the uh, any expansion for the function, you could convert it into con continued fraction and continued fraction unlike expansion is known to converge not only in the radius of convergence, which would be outside the unit circle, but also in, inside uh, the continued fraction converges 
everywhere except vicinity of real singularities. So uh, it's like rational approximation. And we took like 40 terms of equation up to phi to the minus 80. And that's a large enough expansion to get reasonable accuracy. So we found indeed the singularities inside, which are all inside, which are just touching the boundary. And in the middle, there is a cluster of singularities, which we couldn't resolve. But other than that, there are singularities on four axes. And same is true for the uh, velocity. Now, here is the flow. Here is the flow. Uh, that is the profile of, of our surface. And that's a streamline. Is this what you were showing us earlier? The first image that we were talking about at the very beginning? Which one? Uh, in the PowerPoint, or sorry, in the, I guess the Beamer document. You were trying to show us, we were talking about taking the slice of the surface at the yeah. very beginning. I could get back to the, to the, to the slides. Here. Yeah, I think it was the it was very early on. And yeah, that's the formula which I want to show you. Yes. Oh, but the, the picture that you were showing us in the very beginning when you started all this, um, the surface or you took the slice of the surface. Yes. That that picture that you showed us is the picture you're just showing us now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. And the colors, okay, all right, thank you. So here are the, let me show you the slides. That is discontinu, uh, that's the velocity, uh, that's the discontinuity function gamma as you go around the loop. That's a third dimension is uh, 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 gamma and X and Y is this plane. So uh, uh, it, it is negative, then it goes to zero, then it goes to, and here is this discontinuity because we go, when you go around the cylinder, this potential gamma is the real, is a potential, a real part of potential. That potential should have a gap. Uh, and that gap has a meaning of circulation around the loop. The potential, which is logarithm, is a non-unique function, and its gap is a circulation. And that's what it should be, because we do have a circulation around the loop. So that is indeed, you could see it on, the, on, the, on this plot. Now, this is the same thing. X and Y is the plane, and that's the velocity discontinuity, absolute value of velocity gap. So it's finite everywhere. Uh, it goes to some peaks at four corners, but uh, uh, absolute value is continuous. However, at every of one of these um, corners, the, uh, the phase of complex number, which is direction of two-dimensional vector changes. So there is, in fact, a cusp here, uh, uh, because in the terms of the loop, at every of these points, the de derivative tangent vector of the loop has this continuity. It is, has a like, like crease. So that discontinuity in C prime means real discontinuity in V. But that discontinuity is only in the phase of V, not in the absolute value of V. So absolute value of velocity discontinuity is continuous, however, Direction of velocity discontinuity changes at every one of these uh, corners. So these are not interesting problems. These are solutions of, of these equations for, uh, these are solutions. Uh, there are some certain self-consistency equations which determine the missing parameters gamma and V2, the upper limit of the, of the uh, parameter V. Uh, so this is like my kitchen, don't worry about that. So that's a shape. Uh, for a very small parameter mu, like that. And that's a shape for a very large one, clear. So mu varies between zero and one. So that is almost a, a circle. And this is more like a square. Uh, but that's the uh, variation. It varies between these two shapes and um, it's always continuous. That's something which I already showed you complex maps, that's the flow, yes. If you look at that flow, you'll find interesting things. You'll find, of course, it, there is certainly a circulation, right? It, it is circling around this red uh, surface. So that's, now I think it's clear. Z, it's a cross section of the tube. 
tube is perpendicular to us. So I have a closed tube and, and, uh, and this is the flow in X, Y plane. And then there is some trivial component in Z direction, which is linear. Now, <clears throat> inside, the, inside the surface, we have constant strain. Inside the surface solution is very trivial. It's constant strain. Uh, uh, you see, it goes, uh, you can see that it goes uh, from here, it goes down, down, down. From here, it also goes down. And then it collides and goes sideways. And here, there are singular points. So the, if you look at this formal, at, at this flow, you will see that tangential component of velocity is continuous. Uh, like here, for example, mm, it's difficult to see it here, really. Uh, but but the tangential component is continuous. Uh, and the, nor the, the, I mean, the normal component is continuous. Tangential component uh, has this continuity. You see, here, for example, it hits the surface. You see, it hits the surface here, and it goes in opposite direction. So it hits keeps normal component goes out in circles. So it goes in circles and the, and, the discontinu and the discontinuity is here and therefore vertice is only sitting at the surface. There is no vertice inside, no vertice outside. These kinks, are these, are these points, um, is, is the function smooth at these kinks here that you're showing us? Oh, velocity is finite everywhere. Smooth, that's another story. Direction of velocity changes. At these four singular points, mm -hmm. uh, absolute value of velocity is finite and continuous, but phase of, of the velocity changes because velocity is proportional to the de tangent derivative of this curve at the curve. Yes. And tangent derivative of the curve changes phase. So yes, uh, if you're talking about energy, yes. D squared is finite everywhere, uh, 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 but the, the phase of the changes uh, is singular here. It's uh, the flow from the point of view of physical flow is, is perfectly acceptable. Everywhere outside, everything is fine and, and smooth. Exactly on the surface, there are singularities, but these are singularities in the direction or phase of the complex number, not absolute value. And the pressure, how do you, do you have formulas for that as well? Pressure is minus one half V squared. There is nothing to talk about the pressure. Okay. If you have potential flow, here pressure is minus one half V squared for this V. Inside it's min minus one half V squared for that V. And, there, and then, and that solves both equations. Euler equations are solved. You see, if no, you have potential the flow, pressure is Bernoulli, then equations are solved. But then the singular points, how do you define it? These, these I don't have to define it on a singular point. Okay, okay. I see. Okay. Yeah, there is a surface and there is one pressure from one side, another pressure from another side, so what? You see, it's a very special situation. This surface separates topologically region inside and region outside. And that's a very special situation. If, if that would not be a closed surface, then of course I will have to uh, see how I go around and, and and then basically the pressure inside and outside would have the way to communicate and equalize, but here, nothing, nothing like that. Just one solution outside, another inside, and Euler equation doesn't tell me how to, how to match them. Only the CVS conditions allowed me to completely solve the equation. Euler is an ambiguous. Euler says, okay, there could be arbitrary singularity, uh, uh, this uh, water sheet, arbitrary surface of discontinuity. That's what Euler tells me. And Euler didn't know about Navier Stokes. And Navier Stokes, uh, if you consider Navier Stokes in a very small local vicinity of the surface, you'll find that at every point of the surface, you have to have this uh, uh, CBS condition. Otherwise, it will not be stable. And that boundary condition allows me to completely solve the flow. If I have some more time, I will talk about second part, which is at least its probability distribution, uh, but maybe I should schedule another talk if you are interested. I could 
use 15 minutes to kind of give you overview of what is left. Okay. Dennis, what do you think? <laughs> Dennis, Dennis. Oh, I'm muted, maybe. Can you hear me? Yeah, you yeah. are muted, yeah. So I, I could take 15 minutes and describe the statistics. I think it's very interesting and very important. But uh, if, if I already overloaded, uh, then maybe we could do another talk. I don't know. What do you suggest? Why don't you say what you want to say now? OK. So what's the physical origin of this constant background strain? I, I just postulated there is some constant background strain, and I solved the equation, uh, which became a function of these two parameters, P and Q. And I found there is a stability region uh, when P is negative, I didn't discuss it, but P should be negative and Q should be positive. And uh, P should be between minus Q and zero. Uh, so that is uh, the physical region. So what is the physical origin? And uh, mm, here's what I think. Uh, of course, that small surface is not the whole solution. There should be some number of these surfaces. Let's assume, which we later prove, that the diameter of the surface is small compared to the distances between these surfaces. So let's assume that there are many, many such surfaces distributed in space. And the uh, distance between the surfaces is much larger than the diameter of each, each cube. In that case, uh, at the location at every mm, surface, there will be extra strain coming from other surface. So just imagine uh, in the center of the sphere is sitting my surface, and then there's like infinite uh, uh, universe around, like a, a nice sky. <laughs> and every uh, surface far away contributes uh, 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 to the local velocity. And these views of our formula are very well known. Formulas are, uh, you know, decreasing. They are decreasing like one over r squared. So that means uh, the number of, of these surfaces is proportional to r squared dr. Uh, <laughs> the contribution is one over r squared, so it, it is not going away. It's important contribution. This background, uh, which is coming from large number of other, other vortices, indeed is a very important factor, not factor, term. It's a term added uh, 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 to the uh, smooth, it's a kind of smooth velocity uh, added uh, uh, on, on the background of this smooth velocity and finding my solution. Uh, now, if you look at that, the average velocity can be removed by Galilean transformation. That doesn't change anything. But the strain, uh, which is uh, one more derivative of that uh, BOSR formula, that strain is different. It decreases like one over R cube. And uh, still, it's very important. You should add all these terms. Now, what happens if you add many, many terms which are random, which are all different and uncorrelated? You'll get the Gaussian by central limit theorem. You'll get the Gaussian variable. So this thing, which is sum of large, no, infinite number of small terms, become constant, uh, constant mm, uh, random strain. Distrib uh, random strains are distributed with some mm, measure. And that measure is very well known in mathematics. And I'm going to use it. Mm. Here is this measure. If you have a, a Gaussian variable W, mm, which is symmetric uh, matrix, three by three, uh, with zero trace, that's an invariant measure for such matrices. That's basically the Gaussian distribution. And that's the uh, just product of all independent uh, variables. You have because of the symmetry and traces, uh, uh, you have only off diagonal elements uh, and diagonal elements and some of diagonal elements is zero. So that's the invariant measure for the uh, n by n traceless symmetric match. In our case, n equals c, so it is a very simple thing. And uh, here is how it looks. If you parameterize eigenvalues as p, like I do p plus q and p minus q, then that is this distribution. So once you go to very well known, uh, 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 you know, rotation, you, in, you take, introduce rotation uh, matrix, which 
diagonalizes the tensor, and then the measure in, in, in space of this Gaussian tensors will be, you know, all three group element for the rotation times this simple thing. You will get this Gaussian, and that's so called van der Monde determinant, which comes from the product of the differences of eigenvalues. In my case, it's a very simple thing. Here it is. So we have interesting situation. We found solution, which is a function of two random parameters. And we know the distribution of this parameter. So that would allow us to compute all kinds of probability. We not only found the family of multi-parameter, finite dimensional family of solutions of Navier-Stokes equation in the limit of turbulence, in the turbulence limit, but also are gifted with the invariant measure on that manifold. So if you consider the dissipation uh, at any at given mm, P and Q, my uh, dissipation will have the following form. It will be proportional to the uh, circulation raised to the power of three halves. And this invariant ratio will be a function of ratio of P over Q. Uh, and that function is calculable. Using my solution, that's the calculation of this function. And this integral, in fact, is calculable. It's a hypergeometric integral. So we know how the dissipation depends on the parameters P and Q, and we know how P and Q are distributed. And that allows us to find the probability distribution for the dissipation. It is given by this horrible integral, but that integral is calculable, and we get the, the curve. So that's the distribution it's log log plot of probability distribution for the energy dissipation. So here's the mean value, and it decreases very asymmetrically. On one side, it decreases like instantly goes to zero. Another, it's like more like power like um, tail, but still, it has some reasonable distribution, uh, which is calculable and could be compared with experiment. Uh, now, uh, you could go even further because these structures far away, which contributed to my random variables are the same structure as I have. So there is self-consistency equation. If you plug my own solution into this uh, uh, strain coming from those structures, you will get, you could compute the, uh, the, 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 the variance of that random variable, okay? Average of course is zero, but variance you could compute. And when you compute that variance, so that's the picture, right? Here is my uh, vortex structure, and these little little red uh, structures are other structures far away, and little arrows indicate their net circulations, their net vorticities. So, so these things all contribute to the strain, uh, uh, background strain for our solution, and if you could compare average square of these contributions and find the equation for the Oh, uh, so I do this simple algebra. How do you compute this? Mm, you know, I'll skip the mathematics because it's rather trivial. Uh, I just compute the tensor and take the square and average over directions. And I assume there is some density of these structures, uh, unknown density of the structures, which are distributed uh, with respect to distance from my structure. So there is some. Uh, uh, distribution of distances between vortex structures. I don't know what it is, I postulate some distribution. In terms of that distribution, I could then compute uh, uh, variance of, of my, uh, of my uh, uh, strain. That's the variance of the strain given by this formula. And when you substitute my own solution into this equation, you will get, after certain algebra, a very simple formula you'll get that the ratio of energy dissipation divided by size of the cylinder and delta gamma three halves is some calculable coefficient times this. And here we have finally very interesting situation. We now determined everything. There are no unknown <laughs> coefficients. We have no relation between uh, parameters. So the relation looks like that. If you look at that, at that relation, you'll have that viscosity times fifth power of gamma times <laughs> minus sixth power of 
mean distance between structures times L squared should be constant. Energy dissipation energy per unit length of my cylinder should be constant. But that means that since viscosity goes to zero, one of these factors here should grow. And the only factor which could grow will be L. We assume that, that L is infinite. Now from here, we see that L uh, could grow like inverse square root of mu. If, if you compare that, you see that L, which is the size of the cylinder, which was arbitrary. In fact, from here, this equation, you see that it should grow like inverse square root of mu. And that also means that the radius of each surface, uh, which is inversely proportional to square root of sigma, and sigma is proportional to L. So if you plug one thing into another, you'll find out that, that, the, that the radius of the surface in terms of the um, uh, uh, viscosity, which goes to zero, goes to zero. So you find that there is a collection of thin and large uh, uh, tubes. Uh, in, in terms of the distance between them, they are very thin and very large, which is more or less what is experimentally observed in the turbulent flow. There are all these tubes uh, which are uh, thin and uh, large. So that may be explanation. And it will be interesting to compare the scaling laws. Mm. So I and that basically follows from very simple assumptions. I assume that they are small. I assume that they are separated. And then I compute the self-consistent field, the strain created by the same structures far away. I take the, assume it's Gaussian, take its uh, mean square, and I compare the terms, and that's what I get. So I've missed. Uh, something. Uh, we were talking for a long time about the, this tube. Yes. And then we started talking about things that were small. I missed. Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, so here's your what, uh, finish your question. I, do I, I don't want to trust you. No, that, that, so a tube is not small. A no, tube, no, no. Tube is long. Uh, its length is inversely proportional to square of mu. I am considering the limit when mu goes to zero. So, parametrically, the tube is large, yes. It's not infinite, but it's large. So, my hypothesis that it is large compared to the radius uh, kind of uh, holds water. I assume that it's, it's much larger than the radius. That's all I need to derive this solution. Uh, and indeed, it is. Oh, okay. So it's like a stick. It's a stick, yes. It's it's like a spear because the tube could only end with a singularity, in fact. Um, so here is this tip of the spear. First of all, if you go along the if you go along the tube, then because the tube is much lo longer than than this radius, it's, it's exaggerated here. So when you go from one place to another, you will go to the place where the strain is slightly different. You see, the, 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 the distance the, to the other uh, uh, tubes is much larger than the radius, but not much larger than, than the size. So the size is large. So as we go along the tube, the background tends to slowly change. It, its changes are small compared to the radius, but not small compared to the z direction. So <coughs> like if you go half mile along the tube, then you have to solve the equation again with local strain at that place. And that local strain could be directed somewhere else because uh, 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 you move, if you move at the distance, which is comparable to distance to other, surface, to other surfaces, then uh, uh, the strain will be different, right? So these spears uh, point in different directions, randomly. That's right. They are random, yes. There's random rotation because, again, that is uh, written in the coordinate system of, of eigen system of that tensor. So there's a random tensor, and it has, of course, random uh, rotation. So the, the, there is random rotation of the x, y, and z. So this solution, of course, was written in the frame where 
uh, uh, one of the axes uh, is z, another two are x and y, and there are specific inequality like the z axis has negative strain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Only solution could only be uh, in such situation when the strain has um, uh, certain sign of the uh, of the lowest um, eigen eigen value for the negative. Okay. The strain is generic. There are three eigenvalues adding up to zero. So uh, there are certain inequalities between them which are needed uh, for that solution to be stable. And I don't want to go into details. They are all written there. So if, if, if there is this stability condition is satisfied, then there will be a solution. If it is not satisfied, there will be no solution. For example, if this tip apparently what I try to display is the situation where if you go beyond that tip, there is no solution. So that surface should end because there is no stable surface outside. Do you have a uh, experimental picture that you can sort of show us that uh, suggests a connection to this analysis? There is some, there are some, Simulation. It's not experimental, but the numerical experiments. There are some experiments which will show these long tubes. Indeed, I've seen those experiments. There is even a movie. I don't have it in my paper here, but I, in some other talk, I have it. Uh, uh, that movie. Somebody sent me that that paper and that movie. Mm, basically, what you see in experiment, experiment, and that was seen for a very long time, are very long tubes. Uh, uh, are, they are they straight hmm? or are they curved? No, they are not straight. And they have tips. At the end, they are, have tips. Uh, uh, so, yes, you could try to compare that theory with those tubes which have are there experimentally. They are, of course, not straight. They, are, of course, are curved. They are like, you know, macaroni or, uh, I don't know, spaghetti. But they are very uh, sparse. They are not like packed together, they are far from each other. Right. But you know, we, we've seen pictures like that, but they're usually, those are the surfaces of the norm of the vorticity. That's right. That's a surface where vorticity is very large. In real world, this is a surface where vorticity is above certain threshold. Outside the surface, vorticity in my approximation is zero. At the surface, it is infinite. In real world, uh, uh, it will have some viscous background, small vorticity outside, and and here it will be vorticity above certain threshold, which would look like a surface. Here. Oh, okay. So that so okay. So your your models fit with that idea that those tubes that we see that are slightly curved and so on, and all like, arranged like macaroni and so on, uh, are level sets of vorticity. Yes, in my approximation, in, in extreme turbulence, they are surfaces of infinite vorticity and everywhere else vorticity is zero, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, I see. So this is what one sees. Say it again? This is what one sees. I mean, we've seen a lot yes. of Yes. Yeah, it's called intermittency. Intermittency is the fact that that, that uh, what is it is almost zero everywhere, but some places it's very large and then, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So, you're, so you could say this is a conjecture that these pictures that we see are rising because your model is sitting in there. My conjecture is that the vorticity is uh, uh, confined to the set of stable surfaces in the, yeah. in the you know, turbulent flow. In the equilibrium turbulent flow, my conjecture is that vorticity is zero in the proper units everywhere except those surfaces. And, and these surfaces, they're very special surfaces because they wouldn't be stable unless the strain is, is annihilated by the velocity discontinuity. And because it's three dimensional, everything is kind of randomized. I mean, there's this two dimensional picture of the eddies. The spheres are perpendicular to the plane and 
their sizes vary a lot. They're not, they're correlated and stuff. But that's not happening yeah. here. It's more random Look, because of three dimensions. Yes, you know much better than me that topology in all than even dimensions is different. So the nearest analogy for three dimensions would be one or five. Now one is burgers where you indeed have those shocks which are analogs of my surfaces, right? Discontinuity of velocity uh, in burgers uh, is like a surface, except the surface becomes a point. Yeah. In two dimensions, it's very different. In two dimensions, there is, uh, you know, there is the invariant. The strain in two dimensions couldn't be like I want because there are two components adding up to zero. So there is no room for a, for the solution with zero strain, right? So I, I had a different image of the way the spheres end in those pictures I've seen. I thought they ended because the vorticity got sort of diffused, but you're saying there's a singularity there. Well, if, if you imagine the little circulation around the loop. So here, circulation, look, velocity is fine and circulation, circulation is conserved, right? Because there is no flux outside, so if you go along the tube, the circulation is the same constant. That's topologically invariant thing. You could take, take the loop outside the surface, independent of the shape of the loop, it would be the same circulation which the flux through that imaginary stock surface which intersects my surface, okay? Yeah. So when you go closer to the tip, the loop shrinks, but uh, velocity could be singular. You could in fact find Mm, on a sphere, for example, you could find such coordinates uh, like uh, like velocity has a pole at one of the or other part of the sphere. Velocity is like uh, like one over one minus z, or in, 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 in terms of the sphere, or one plus z. So if velocity has a pole, then the circulation of velocity near the tip is a constant, and that is like a residue in the pole. So can you can you write a formula for something that might be an example of the tip? Oh yeah, uh, it will be integral uh, complex <laughs> z over z. Uh, <laughs> velocity is one over z, where z is this tip, and uh, circulation is complex integral uh, over dz, and that integral is constant and uh, equal to residue uh, in the pole. Yeah, but but if you slide the curve past the tip. Oh, no, 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 no. It ends here. So circulation beyond the tip doesn't exist. I'm talking about the circulation around the surface. Well, okay, that's a formula before you get to the tip, but what's a formula on a neighborhood of the tip? It's still integral. Uh, integral. Uh, if you have complex coordinates, uh, uh, it will be integral dz over z. No, but what's the formula for the velocity? One over z. But in where z is this thing. Uh, and potential will be logarithm z. Well, well no, but it's one over z before you, in, in the plane perpendicular to, to your screen. Yes, yes. And it's one over z, but what's it like in that z in that other direction? Well, I'm talking about the velocity on the on the surface. If, if you go to the sphere, you could also have uh, uh, on a sphere. You could also introduce some coordinate related to the you know Euler angles or or uh, uh, stereographic mapping, and it will be similar. But outside, oh, we mean what will be outside? Mm, well, if the surface if outside, it will be a singular velocity. Yes. I think if, if velocity at exactly the surface is singular, then outside it should also be singular if you approach. I'm not sure. It should be, yes. It'd be nice to have a model of a neighborhood of the, of the tip of the sphere. I only have the model on the surface, two-dimensional. I don't have three-dimensional model, but that must be doable. Yeah, that's a good solvable, good problem which can be solved. Yeah, okay. 
One could even, you know what? I think if you consider uh, the conic uh, singularity, uh, that is almost the same as the plane. So if, if there's a regular conic singularity, maybe the uh, Berger solution can be solved uh, uh, in more general situation when uh, it is not the plane, but the cone. Yeah. On the cone, you should make conformal mapping, which maps that cone into the into half plane. Yeah. So that, that's a fraction of power of Z. Yeah, nobody has done it. It will be very interesting indeed to solve Navier-Stokes equations in the vicinity of the conic conic singularity. Vortex surface with conic singularity. Or just even make a velocity field that looks reasonable. The Navier-Stokes, of course, couldn't have infinity. It is everything will be smeared by velocity, uh, viscosity. So it will be something more complex than than uh, this Gaussian. I don't know what it will be. Why don't we open the floor to any other questions? Are we we're, we're done with your talk now? Is that, can we? I'd like to hear some questions about something which bothers me myself, uh, namely. How come, uh, how come this conservation of entropy, which is a very important part of, of the whole construction I presented, how come that conservation of entropy didn't kill that trouble in theory for the last 80 years? I don't understand how the, the trouble in theory reconciled with that lack of conservation of entropy. I really don't understand. There must be maybe some. I'm missing something. You see, if you assume there's a stable, uh, steady solution, then of course everything is conserved on a steady solution. But but nobody knew that steady solution, right? Well, wait, wait. I have a. Are, are Theo and Vincent still here? Are either of you still here? Is Theo still yeah, here? I'm, I'm Theo. Here. Yeah. So yeah. You, yeah, you've I'm here. Talk, you've talked about Theo. You've talked about this cancellation. <laughs> Uh, in fact, Vincent talked about it too, but it was in dimension two two D. But but let's but you both talked about these two terms canceling, right? I think you have these same two terms or different. Well, sort of the cancellation of two things that would some some balance between two things that allowed. Uh, some stability to happen. I remember that qualitative feature. Theo, does that ring a bell? Um, well, maybe it was Vincent. It was Vincent. Well, I, 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 I know that. that um, I'm uh, thinking, yeah. I mean, no, you had to cancel. You had two things canceling. You were doing the KDV or something. You were doing some slightly different equation, but still you had you had a conservation you were canceling two things i remember so i mean could you could, could you repeat the the question you asked I, I may oh. have so it. what was the the position of conventional theory without water surfaces to the problem of non-conservation of entropy entropy because there are there is a Water staging violates conservation, and so does diffusion. And uh, they should cancel, kind of. Otherwise, the whole thing which we kept constant for 80 years wouldn't be constant. But how they cancel? That's the question. I mean, um, well, so directly from the equation for uh, the vorticity, I guess you have a, a global cancellation statement if you have a steady solution just by integrating the equation. Yes. Right. So the yes. average of time derivative is zero. Therefore, they have to globally cancel. I agree. Yeah. 
but then but then you seem to be making some assertion about the relevance of a local cancellation for turbulence so i mean local in time or something no local I mean, in space local in local space local in space sorry local in space yeah because if if it's not conserved locally in space that would basically mean that something would leak from the surface from my point of view it's impossible um, but i mean why why does the i mean this surface that you have, I mean, it's an extremely precise and mathematical s structure, but why? So I, I guess the thing I don't understand is why do you expect that real fluid turbulence looks like it's built of structures like that? Well, but we, wait, 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 wait. We had a big discussion about that. Last no, but that. Week, wait, we had, as Theo was talking last week and previous week. No, but that, that's, that's very different. It has to have structures like that because you have to compensate factor of viscosity in front of entropy. We know dissipation is constant, we know it's proportional to viscosity, and the remaining factor is, is integral of omega squared. If omega doesn't have infinities, it will be not, it will not compensate. So it's absolutely it obvious. No, 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 but that's a different statement. I mean, so I agree that the that the entropy has to grow indefinitely as viscosity goes to zero. That's a different statement than saying it has to organize into regular vortex sheet structures. It does organize itself in, in lines, for example. Yes, it could organize is... itself on fractal sets. I mean, it could organize itself on much uh, more complicated sets than. Yes, I totally agree. But until somebody presents solution with those sets, I'm presenting solutions where everything is fine and it is just as possible. I mean, they're, they're so, okay. So, um, oh, wait, wait, Theo, do you, you didn't understand our discussion that we just had, where we connected it, a seal's lecture and his lecture are connected, conjectural. I, I, I take an issue with that. Um, so the, a seal is, I don't know if a seal is here, but so a seal was describing a certain um, uh, way to analyze turbulent data by looking at these oh, thresholds. Of... Sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, it's not a seal. It was, it was maybe Ali or something. I think Glim. I think Glim mentioned something about him and no, his no, team. No, no. But here's what we. Here is so many, several of the lectures. There was the idea that these macaroni pictures, which were produced, how were they produced? I kept asking, and the answer was but... there were levels of the norm of vorticity. Yes, yes. yeah. That, that was the answer, okay? Levels of norms of vorticity. And I think there were some in the SEALs talk too. But anyway, just, it's not a mathematical statement. Computer systems computed the pictures of levels of norms of vorticity and they got this macaroni picture. Yeah. Right, okay, now, and I just, we're talking, with Sasha was saying he has a model of something that has a surface in it. And then it turned out, and I asked him, is there something computer experiment picture that fits with your theory? And he started talking about it. And then we discussed a little more and then it turned out the structure of the vorticity in his model fits with those pictures. Yes, I that's know that very well. Point. I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, he has got a mathematical model of something these are just computer pictures. They both have this picture. They're these spherical bent spheres that end in, end in points. That's what we've been discussing. And he has a model for what happens near the surface that makes it stable. So. I have conjecture, Dennis. Model means that I am not solving equations, but just waving hands. I'm solving equations using certain conjectures and then the rest is not model, it's exact solution. Conjecture is that it is a vertice surface. That's a conjecture. But given that conjecture, I'm finding solution with these properties of the good old Navier-Stokes equations without any model assumption. So I'm kind of trying to claim that it is not a model. Oh, okay, wait, let, let, me, let, let me just, I'm, I'm like a, uh an umpire in this baseball game. I don't know anything about this, but I'm hearing you talk and I'm hearing Theo talk and I'm hearing all these talks. And it is a little remarkable if you just do a computer study 
and you compute the level sets of a function, the norm of vorticity in this case, and choose some value, that you get some surfaces that look like they have some structure. And I see them, all, these, all of these talks, the pictures look very similar. Many of the pictures, they have these tubular things and they end. I used to think they end because they got diffuse or something and something went to zero or something. But he's, he has a different model now. So he's giving a model for something that seems to fit with that observation. Yes, you correctly described what I'm trying to do, yes. And it, it involves conceptual ideas that the, the you sort of, I don't, that the high level, I don't know, it's a, the high value of vorticity organizes, organizes itself. I don't know, it's strange. Uh, how can we state something? What I'm trying to say is that these high levels of vorticity cannot organize themselves in any arbitrary shape or fractal because there is stability condition. And that stability condition follows from microscopic solution of the Navier-Stokes equation in the local tangent plane, if you assume that that is a surface, smooth surface. Otherwise, I don't know what to do. But there are by surfaces in Navier-Stokes, there are those Burgers planes, and the conditions are very well known. And uh, I just took those conditions and solved, found the general surface satisfying these conditions. I, I, don't, okay, I don't really understand the, the stability statement. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I mean, well, for that, one, if, yeah. that statement was pretty, what, what's hard to understand about it? It's in his I mean, model. I, well, I don't the know. I just don't let me repeat the statement. the statement. Let me repeat the statement. You could solve uh, the Navier-Stokes equations exactly in the plane uh, with arbitrary background strain. This plane approximates the tangent plane for the smooth surface. Now you could take arbitrary value of the uh, strain, uh, constant strain, because it's the uh, infinitesimal vicinity of the point. So it's constant strain. You could solve equation for arbitrary constant strain with three arbitrary eigenvalues. And you'll find out that only in case of one of these eigenvalues equals zero, you have stable solution because you could find solution for arbitrary eigenvalues. And it, for unless one of the eigenvalues is zero, the solution, describes the vorticity which is leaking outside. It doesn't just, is not confined to the surface. So the solution, and you, if you find the time dynamics, you'll find that it's unstable. That was done in my work, and then it was much better done in the work of Sharif and, and another guy. So that is a res mathematical result of exact solution of navier stokes equation in local vicinity of the surface. So from that point, it's very well justified. That's a, Solution. Uh, solution is stable only if at every point of the surface uh, you have this stability condition. But I mean, that, I, okay, I don't, again, I don't fully understand, but it seems like you're describing some property of the solution where the particle's going in that exact solution when you say stable. But uh, for the, for the, dynamics of the fluid, I, I don't see how you can make a stability statement about that type of solution. By solving stationary, uh, non-stationary Navier-Stokes equations exactly. And no, but you can't solve it exactly if you purchase Well, I did and published the paper in, in, in uh, it's, uh, it's called Asymmetric Vortex Sheet. I found exact solution of Navier-Stokes equation for the uh, strain, which is not more general than the burgers. Yes, okay, but if you perturb that solution, then you can no longer solve it exactly, of course. That, that's like, right. That can be solved numerically, yes. That can be solved numerically for small perturbation. That was done by that person, yes, people, yes. I only found uh, station. I mean, it, I don't know any example of a, a large solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is stable. I mean, uh, you know, for especially at small viscosity. I don't, I don't really know what it means. No, I no, mean, it I, is with viscosity. It is solution found by burgers. It's this Gaussian solution. I can give you the reference. It's very new. Um, well, here we go. Look at this paper. Sharif and Elsin uh, Nsinga, viscous vortex layer subject to more general strain, et cetera, et cetera. 
So it's published in the physics of fluids this year. Um, it started with my paper where I found particular solution and they generalized that and found the more the general solution for arbitrary strain and they found that it is stable. It is, I'm sorry, it is unstable in all cases except burgers. What does that mean, except burgers? Okay, let me show you this solution. Maybe you will understand if I show you the formula. Uh, because it's not like hand waving, it's just solution. And here, um, Mm. Here, uh, the solution has very specific form. It's not like it's something. Um, so, um, mm. Mm. Uh, I, I, okay, 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 okay. okay. Mm. Here we go. I think in the very beginning I described it. Um, uh, it is a, a formula which is uh, hold on. Um, so that's the solution. It has a form of exponent Gaussian times Hermit polynomial of fractional index, which is equal to the ratio of the eigenvalues. So that's the formula for the solution. And only in case of eigenvalue equals zero, it becomes uh, the ordinary Gaussian. And for any of these solutions for lambda do is known non-zero, uh, you could find the time evolution and find it's unstable. That's what was done in that paper of uh, Sharif and Sikhmer. Wait a minute. Uh, so so wait, uh, I thought these were stationary solution. Or, or, yes, but you could also uh, uh, take the, uh, take the non-stationary equation, Navier-Stokes equation, uh, around this solution with initial value. You take initial condition that at the moment T equals zero, it equals this solution. And then you, or small perturbation around the solution, and then you see how it evolves. And you'll find out that for the Gaussian it stays uh, and doesn't change uh, for this Burger's case, but all others corresponding to index non-zero, all others are unstable. Either they go to zero or they go to infinity. So this is the most general solution, and that is uh, corresponds to this non-decreasing, you know, uh, shape. So this yellow shape is the Gaussian solution, and that Gaussian solution stays. If you find time evolution of all these shapes, the yellow one, the Gaussian, stays where it is. And others, uh, uh, the one uh, which is asymmetric goes to zero, and the one which is called super Townsend goes to infinity. So how do, how do they study the perturbation? I mean, this is like an infinite energy. They study numerically. It's it's an infinite energy solution on the whole plane. How do you study it numerically? Well, you write equation for small perturbation, which is. But it's a, it's on it's defined on the whole plane, and it's infinite energy. So how do you study it on a computer? They did it. Uh, 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 I think they. Mm. This is I not think a they did linear. I, I think they did linear, linear, uh, linearization, and then it was easy. Uh, so this linearization is not could be yeah. studied. Yes, linearization could be studied uh, using Fourier, and it. Uh, it uh, I'm not sure how it is. I mean, how do you do it's Fourier this, in a function? This is not a periodic function, right? Um, no, it's not a periodic function, uh, but it's two-dimensional problem because we're sm calling small perturbation of the uh, of the solution in the normal direction. So you are working on a plane. I don't know. I don't want to be responsible 
or something which I didn't do. They studied time evolution of that, and they, in their paper, they presented these two cases. And the claim is that both of these solutions are unstable, Laponov unstable. So one just goes to zero, another goes to infinity, but both are not staying. So, so this one has, <laughs> you know, Laponov index zero, and it doesn't change. And other two go to zero or infinity. No, not my statement, so I don't want to be responsible. I'll have to look at the paper. Yes, I think it's a very interesting paper and it's confirmed by the numerical experiments because in numerical experiments, uh, you also have um, um, only these solutions. You basically don't have other solutions. You have all these Gaussian, uh, smooth Gaussian, uh, you know, surfaces, they are observed, but, but the ones you could check the Gaussian profile, they are there. Mm. Stable surfaces have this Gaussian shape. Uh, the ones with the power tail are not stable, they are not observed. So in numerical simulations, they simply didn't see uh, others because unstable ones don't emerge in numerical simulations. In, you know, big scale numerical simulations, like uh, in a big box with all these, uh, you know, SFT and everything. But they also studied small perturbation around this uh, 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 planar solution of burgers. And that perturbation, I believe, was solved as a two dimensional problem, which is much simpler. Hmm. I, I, have, I have two. two uh, small questions related to your discussion. First question yes. for, for the speaker, and then I want to ask a question to anyone in the audience I feel. But uh, what is the norm of the vorticity inside the tube? Well, it's Gaussian with, uh, with the amplitude one of our new and the width uh, new. So, I mean, it's approximation to the delta function. So at any finest viscosity, you know, in case of the finite viscosity in real world, it is just a Gaussian, so it's okay. some large number, one of our new. So it's it's uh, it's it's a Gaussian which is peaked at the surface. Yes. Okay. Fine. Okay. So then, then the question I have for anyone who knows about numerics. Uh, so when I'm listening to these lectures and I hear they they get this macaroni by uh, plotting some levels of the vorticity. What does that mean? They, they look for big values of the vorticity and plot that? I saw these papers, yes. They're looking wait, at the I'm big value. The wait, I'm asking the audience now. Who is I'm sorry. Talks. I'm asking the audience now. When, when I see these yeah. pictures, they all look very similar. And I've been seeing them for years, actually, of these tubes. And I didn't know they were levels of vorticity and so or, or, or are they regions of high norm of vorticity perhaps that's is that is that what they're computing yeah so to each point in the domain you associate a scalar value which is just the magnitude of the vorticity vector there and then these regions are typically just those the, the boundaries of the set of space defined by magnitude bigger than some threshold m okay Okay. And, and threshold is like mean, mean squared value all okay, over the okay, Wait, 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 wait. So then if we apply uh, that algorithm to his model, we get his surface. Yeah, I mean, it will just look like there's a curve where the vorticity takes a maximum and then you, you cut, I mean, there's a surface around that representing the vorticity magnitude and you just cut that surface with different thresholds, it'll be like a tube around the curve. Well, where'd the curve come from? You don't a priori know it's a curve. Well, the it's a Gaussian centered at I guess z equals zero, or whatever the. No, 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 no. They're doing the they're doing the numerical experiment. They don't have any formula at all. Oh, I misunderstood your question. I thought you were talking about the, the levels of the formula he had. 
No, no. I asked him that question. Now I'm asking you the question. When we see all these numerical observations, what is the algorithm? And then you told me the answer. You said yeah. you, you, you just cut off the, back, the, the big values of the... No, I think it's... I'm sorry. It is the wait, wait, don't levels of... I'm in the middle of a goddamn sentence because we, we, can't, we can't have logical flow of ideas. Come on. Jesus. Wait a minute. Theo, you said you just take, you take the, you cut off the big values of the vorticity, right? Is, is that how it's done? Yeah, I mean, you just, it's the, the set of uh, vorticity, mag, so it's the boundary of the set where the vorticity magnitude is bigger than some threshold M. Okay. Now, a priori, if you took a random function, what would that look like? I don't know. Depends on the random function, maybe. I don't know. Not tubes. Okay, so yeah, exactly. I don't think it would look like tubes. So since it does look like tubes, then his model, if you apply his, that algorithm to his model, you do get his surface, right? So that's what I was, yeah. suggest that's what I was suggesting then. Since we see these tubes and he sees tubes, and then we ask, how did you compute your tubes uh, to the people doing those experiments? They say what you said about cutting off the high levels of norm of vorticity. Then the two things are consistent. Okay. And then, and that stability that we observe is sort of philosophically partially explained by the stability analysis that he's doing in this toy model. That's all I'm done. I'm trying to make. I'm trying to uh, make lemons out of le lemonade out of le lemons here, right? You, ha you have a very confusing situation. We're not talking about theorems anymore. We're talking about trying to get some picture of what's happening, right? I mean, yeah. he's, he's suggesting a logical and in an example, stable, you, you have an exact solution. This is the physicist, the physicist approach. You find some exact, solution of something and then you perturb it and study the parameters and see get some sense out of it so he's saying he gets some sense out of it in this case and then we're saying oh well it fits with these other macaroni things that we've been watching for the last few months and which and for the last decades when you look you see these tubes right i and i had no idea why i thought the tubes well, I thought they were kind of vortex tubes or something, and the, the vorticity was diffusing at the end, so they didn't keep going straight. I didn't know what they were. But. And now there's this, how did it, so we did, we had another discussion is how do the tubes end, right? And with the end of the sphere, so there's sort of a doable problem there to try to make toy models of that. That's also in this context. Okay. And I also thought maybe if you had a random function, maybe when you took levels, it did look like tubes. That's another possibility, but you don't think so, right? I, I mean, but I don't have a great reason for not thinking so. I, I don't, just an intuition, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, in fact, there was a talk at the Institute uh, and someone, they did a random level and they, uh, yeah, they did a random, a, a level set of a random function and they got that uh, <laughs> there was some evidence. This was Peter Sarnak. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got some evidence that there is statistically likely that there's one large component, connected component of the level. That was a strange thing also. Yeah, that is strange, you know? Yeah, so that doesn't fit with this at all. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what kind of random functions they were like? Well, they had some Gaussian field or something. I see, I see. I see. But, but I don't know, I don't know what that means. I can say that phrase, I don't know what it means. It will not be continuous if it's Gaussian. You, you move one millimeter aside, it will be, could be anywhere. It well, would it not be continuous surface. It was a statistical, 
it was it was sort of a random something and they took the level and it turned out it was a jump from two to three and in, in, in dimension two you got many little levels all over the place like a big eigenfunction sort of idea and then in fact in answer to your question florian is that your name i forgot your name the student who just said something. Oh, Ra Raphael. Oh, Raphael. 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 Ra Raphael. Yeah, there was. It was interesting because there was a jump from dimension two, random level, and they were doing like eigenfunctions, big eigen. You know, take a big eigenspace of Laplacian or something, and take a random point in that finite dimensional space, and take a level or something. Like that. We've seen a lot of things like that, but then there was a jump in dimension two. You got one kind of picture, and then in dimension three, it seemed there was you get a lot of complicated things, but there seemed to be a statistically a large component in the level. Wouldn't it be hard to reproduce if I understand what you're saying? Just basically jump, put a whole bunch of random points in two and three space, and then compute the level sets. And you're saying that there should oh, be no, no, no. Oh. You have a function, a specific formula. I see. An oh, eigen... I see. I see. Finite dimensional space. You take a finite, big finite dimensional space, eigenspace of Laplacian, and then just take a random function in there and then compute the levels. There was, I'm making that up a little bit. I, I don't remember the details. They had some legitimate way of talking about a random function, and they had this evidence that of that large component. But we're not seeing that here. We're seeing these tubes in dimension three. Because these are special functions, they're solutions of Navier Stokes equation, norm of velocity. And then there's there's a consistency between the computation and what the lecture today was about, because this the region of high vorticity norm was tang the nor the vorticity was sort of tangent to the surface. And uh, but I think the confusion is maybe because the solutions talked about in today's lecture appear to arise from a very special situation. However, you still derive these, you know, geometric structures that you would see in, in nat more natural settings, I should say, maybe. Well, and, there's, and there's some weird thing no, happening. Well, it's just a, yeah, no, the things that we saw, this macaroni that one sees rather ubiquitously these sort of curved spheres and cutting off, that's very common. Uh, the lecture by Ali had a lot of things like that in it too, when they... I can show. Um, I, I yeah, can I don't show really know. Yeah, I don't really know what these things look like outside of this lecture, so it would be helpful. If, if I, some more, yeah, just, yeah, just, Click, you know, go look up films of fluids, and you'll see these macaroni things. If, if you, if if I can share my screen one second, I I could show. Can can you, Sasha? Do, do you do you mind if I I share the screen sure, one sure. second? Go ahead, go ahead. I could I could uh, stop. If I talk too much. I will stop sharing now. Here we go. I'm stop sharing. Stop okay, sharing, so... but don't stop talking. <laughs> so <laughs> you. That's hard for screen. me. I cannot stop yeah, talking. I know, I know. It. It's hard when you and I are together. We both talk too much. <laughs> uh, does everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yes. So here you. you oh, know. These are, I know. That's exactly yeah, the exactly. thing I wanted to. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. What is this exactly? Sorry to be that person. I, what are no, all no, the it's, it's colors? Exactly what I. Exactly what I said. So you just you to each point in the domain you associate a number, which is the magnitude of the vorticity vector field at that point, and then you look at the boundary of the set, which corresponds to that number being bigger than some threshold m. The color corresponds to different thresholds. Well, if you allow, oh, the, I see. So, so you have to think of these as more than one picture. Yeah, and you can think, you see the the higher ones are contained in the the bigger, the lower ones, like in Sasha's solution, right? It's, it's sort of a tubes within tubes when you do different thresholds. But when we looked at this in 2D in your lecture, you ran this for a oh, long no, no, time. Wait. Don't 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 bring in 2D. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, don't sorry. bring in 2D yet because okay. then that'll create. Oh, that is more like it. 
Yeah, see, so this whole lecture was about us, in a sense, on a, a small neighborhood of the surface of one of those tubes. That's, that's what it was about. And the reason that stable surface is there is suggested by the, the lecture, by the discussion of the lecture. Wow. Wow. So these are different thresholds. Yeah. So they're disjoint. <laughs> yeah. Because it's a function. We learned that in freshman calculus. <laughs> f of x, if given x, f of x is determined, right? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. That's a yeah. great thing. So that's what the lecture's about. Come on. We should, let's applaud the speaker. Thank you. I tried my best to keep my mouth shut. Okay. <laughs> but you are a great audience. I really appreciate the discussion. I have a, like a feeling of fresh air. <laughs> Asil, what do you have to say about this? Okay, I need to think about it. I need to think about it. It's not trivial. <laughs> I need to think about it. I need to read the, the paper. It is uh, published in, in archive. Yeah, I didn't see them. There are a couple of them in archive. I just downloaded them. Mm -hmm. I, but I would like to ask a, sort of a, a computer expert type question. If you have a function and you take its levels, cut them off, threshold thing, why does it look, is it automatically going to look smooth? Actually, what they do is they first uh, mollify the field. I see. And, and then they compute its levels. So, okay. it, so yeah. Make it smooth by definition. So to speak. Yeah. Okay. So then, okay. All right. Then you can study it as a function of the mollification parameter. And indeed, it gets rougher as you make the, but I mean, there's, of course, you know, um, fundamental restriction due to the size of the grid. So you can't, can't become too fine. I see, right. Well, now I'm... Those tubes look very, um, not as pointy. Right? Wasn't there talk of a spear or something? I mean, the video you showed, they were like uh, almost like ellipsoid smash down kind of. Yeah. I think the word was. Hard. I think the word was sphere, not spear. Or oh, or... sorry, got it. All right, all yeah. right. I was imagining this pointiness, and I didn't really see that in the videos. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, is it spear or sphere? I don't know. I, I I'm I'm remembering what you said. Gosh, is he gone? Oh, uh, yes, I'm not gone. I mean, in my view, that should be a sphere because I simply can't no, see how S -P, the... S-P or S-P-H? S no, S-P-E-R, like, uh, like something ju uh, oh, javelin, right. javelin, javelin, javelin. That's what I thought like, of. Uh, the projectile. So a singularity. Where the, where the, where the yeah, I need singularity. Otherwise, I don't know how to explain the conservation of the, of the flux. You yeah. see? The flux has to end up with singularity, otherwise it would be non-conserved. Yeah, yeah, the topology, you know, d theta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for the smooth, <laughs> if you have a uh, topological sphere without singularities, then, uh, then circulation around every, uh, any third, uh, third, uh, loop is contractible and is zero. But if there are singularities of velocity field at one or two points, then everything is fine. And then, and then what, uh, God, I forgot your name again, Florian. Raphael. Oh, sorry, yeah. Raphael. No, you're you're going to be Florian for a year at least. <laughs> okay, Raphael. No, so Raphael is observing. The artist, think of the Renaissance artist. Yeah, right. well, I know, but I, okay, you know, our, uh, you're, uh, he's observing that at the end of this, of this hypothetical spheres in the picture are look very smooth because that's related to what Theo said. You smooth the data before you take the level. So you change the data. So if, even if you had a singularity, 
when you smoothed it, it would go away. So can we look the picture again? Sure. So maybe. Yeah, but that's some really aggressive smoothing because the, the picture in the Beamer slides, it's like very pointy, right? Which picture in the Beamer slide? I don't remember, but I mean, uh, this is a different simulation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can we go back? Yeah. They, they... yeah well, how about those? Those have pointy. Look, they're, they're kind of pointy. Well, some are pointy. I mean, you know, it's. But there is a definite linearity that's interesting, right? I mean, that's definitely. So, I mean, already one could study that. What do random levels look like? And then what makes them look like this, you know? <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> How's Irene, Theo? She's good. good. She's, uh, yeah. Usually Theo has to leave us for Irene. <laughs> well, this is an early talk, right? This, this is an earlier today, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me say a few words. I know you zipped my mouth, uh, but I want to say something unrelated. I want to thank you all because that was the best seminar of recent time for me where we really talked about substance and didn't slide through the uh, uh, salesman pitch. And I'm very happy that we really discussed things and I learned a lot from you guys. And I hope you learned something from me also. So thank you very much. Well, it was and it's, that's a great seminar. Yeah, okay. But by the way, actually, uh, Sasha, I mean, what I wanted to say, when I was a graduate student, I, I read your papers from the 90s on, on the loop theory of turbulence. and. I always found it very attractive. I mean, in particular, I, uh, you have this reformulation of the Euler equation as um, an active scalar equation uh, on loop space for the circulations, right? So you, you write down, and yes. I, you know. So I, 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 yeah, I always found that perspective very attractive from the point of view of uh, coming up with a notion of solution to the Euler equation that's somehow more robust than a classical solution and also a weak solution. Namely, can you define a solution um, via your dynamics for the circulation on loop space in, in a more general context and then interpret the resulting solution as um, uh, an Euler solution in physical space, some type of Euler solution in physical space? Namely, can you can it really describe a turbulent solution? I just wanted to know your thoughts about that. I mean, how, well, what is my point? observation was that this mm, loop equation, uh, uh, basically uh, at large a loop where you can solve them, uh, uh, have to reduce to some classical solution. I call them instantons or or some singular solutions. So uh, my conjecture, which was you know kind of confirmed by experiment uh, uh, was that indeed there is some singular, some very specific uh, uh, surface bounded by that loop. Uh, and that surface have some singular distribution of vorticity. And uh, I made some hypothesis about that. And uh, mm, uh, that explained the data for, there was this data for the distribution of circulation for large loops. And uh, it has this, uh, uh, exponential law. It's not a Gaussian. It's, it's just exponential and pre-exponential. So a hypothesis of the classical solution responsible for that, uh, uh, which, you know, every classical solution falls the loop equation. I mean, it's kind of trivial. Mm, but uh, uh, so I tried to do a lot of things with loop space, but in the end, I found that when it comes to uh, solutions, it's easier to solve uh, uh, the Euler equation directly because there are some powerful methods of doing that. 
and um, Could you? only trivial things can be found from from the loop space, uh, like like uh, area law or that kind of generic things. But if you really want to solve the equations, you need to know the, the solution for the field around the surface, and there is no way around it. Too much. So it was instructive, but in the end, I, I switched to the good old <laughs> Laplace, I mean, Navia Stokes and Euler, because that is where you get exact solutions. Can we see okay. a picture of those equations, Theo? Can you? Can you I can, yeah. Um, let me try to find. Uh, because there's been a lot of new progress on the loop space. Yeah, uh, just give me one second. Are we talking about loops? Yeah, there is exact linear equation, Lux Schrodinger equation. And there's some Hamiltonian in loop space. So mathematically, I think it's a very interesting statement that that uh, you know mathematically it's, it's specific version of the Hopf equation. Uh, but uh, this uh, what is that? This, this is these are some notes of mine um, where, mm -hmm. where where I, I, I write your your equation. Uh -huh. um, so uh, the way I understand it, it say, yeah. say it again. Yeah, of course, that's right. Yeah, I agree. Eight? I agree with that. Wait, Dennis, I can't hear you. But... What is equation eight? Right, so equation eight is one way I'm writing the, the Euler equation. Um, it's the, So K is the circulation. So yeah. I define a... Right, right, right. Yeah, K is a circulation. And the circulation is just advected by the velocity field and the velocity field itself is reconstructed from all the circulations. So you, you regard this equation as just pushing the circulation around in loop space by some non-locally determined velocity functional of those circulations. So what is L? L is this operator that takes you from uh, the collection of circulations and gives you back a incompressible velocity vector field. Yeah, but, but pressure drops. That's the beauty of that equation. Yeah, yeah, pressure is not there precisely because you're 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 you know precisely because you're working with loops, so you're sort of you know yeah. built into the space. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, and why, um, why is why is you ha why you have an operator that gives you a function of a point? It's a function on curves. Yeah, wh where's the point? Uh, it could just be that it's um, a oh, typo, it's but. No, the, the operator is in loop space. You change the variation of the take the variation of the loop. This is yeah. not yet in loop space. Well, the, this is actually the velocity along the loop. So this is like a set. It's not at a point. It's uh, pushing you along the loop. So this is actually a, a different way to write oh, this oh, equation. Is like it's a, it's a vector field along the loop. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And what is the nature of that operator, L? Well, it's it's not. Uh, this is just. Actually, I mean, it's not a hundred percent clear to me. I, I'm still trying to understand. I, I understand it crudely, but I don't want to say. Okay. Too much. Um, mm, uh, well, you want to vary the shape of the loop and achieve the same effect as you achieve with the Euler equation. That's the whole game. So when you change the shape of the loop by adding a little loop on the side, you will uh, 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 add. A, circulation around this little loop and circulation around this little loop is omega and omega can be expressed in, ter in terms of variation of the shape of the loop. So yeah, that, that's true. So, right. So one way you can think about recovering the velocity from the circulations is if you shrink the, you, you have all circulations at your disposal. So if you consider loops that are shrinking to a point from that, you can recover components of the vorticity vector field in yes. the direction, which is, Perpendicular oh, okay. to the area. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can, that, I can yeah. put topological analysis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, yeah, you can formally write this equation like this. You know, you sort of, it's just advection in loop space. But so my my interest in this was to try to think of this equation as maybe a, a, the fundamental starting point. Then say, you know, can you can you find solution of this equation? Outside of the um, outside of the class of classical solutions of the Euler equation, namely, as you said, Sasha, if you have a classical solution, then it's a solution of the loop equation. But K 
can you define a solution of the loop equation that generalizes the notion of solution for That's a, a good question. Loop? I don't know that because I couldn't, you see, it, it is funny. The loop equation is linear equation. It's linear equation in this uh, 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 large space. It's it's equation well, like Schrodinger equation. The d d t equals some uh, loop operator acting on the function of the loop. So oh. from the point, so it is a linear equation, and the viscosity plays the role of the Planck's constant. So it's like Schrodinger equation. So d time derivative of 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 the loop functional is if if you put it into exponential, uh, if you put the circulation exponential. Uh, time derivative is some operator applying to that same thing. And the beautiful observation is, in my view, is that the viscosity going to zero corresponds to WKB. So the, the so what? What? the, so, I mean, if you, the viscosity enters that equation uh, in the same way as it enters the Schrodinger equation, like Planck's constant. So viscosity is like Planck's constant. So uh, uh, from the point of view of loop equation, Turbulence, the limit of zero viscosity, corresponds to WKB approximation. Uh, and uh, uh, if I would know how to do that in, in loop space, that would solve uh, the equation. So the only the way I found was using the classical solution, but maybe there is a more general uh, uh, thing. Yeah, I mean, at least it depends on the type of question you want to ask. If you want to make a specific statement about a turbulent fluid, maybe it's not suitable, but what I'm asking is more, is there a general description that can be encapsulated by some type of loop solution, loop space solution that could in principle describe the turbulent flow? Maybe not in detail, but at least could be a, putative, could be a description of it. And what you can say from it is a different story. Yeah, I, I spent years trying to do that, both in, uh, in quantum chromodynamics and in turbulence. In quantum chromodynamics, it's much harder, uh, but here it is relatively simple because the equation is linear after all. So it's non-trivial functional equation, but it's much simpler than the Hopf equation. Hopf equation is also linear equation, also like Schrodinger equation, but it has functional of three-dimensional field. So Hopf is a functional equation in three-dimensional space, and this is functional equation in one-dimensional space because loop is one-dimensional space. Loop is a field in one dimensional space. What is a loop? It's a periodic function of arbitrary parameter theta. So you have, uh, instead of field theory, you have one dimensional field theory, but very nonlinear and singular. And uh, I, I mean, I would love mathematicians to bring it to the level of, of other constructions where you have abstract spaces and you know what they mean and what are the properties and what are the, uh, you know, Mm. Well, nothing of that is, was done there well i think this is this is this is within reach yeah this is in reach because these are maps of a circle and so yes it's, it's not necessarily smooth yeah because the equations don't close on the smooth ones if you want to add little infinitesimal uh, 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 things to the loop it is not necessarily differentiable so Otherwise, the equations would not close. So, what if you uh, smooth it, like we were talking about, with a mollifier? No, no, no. Well, we don't, you, we don't want to mollify. Yeah, you, you, you okay. don't want to destroy the. No, network. we're talking about about loops. Uh, if you take circulation around some loop uh, uh, and consider average of that as a functional of the loop, unfortunately, equations don't close on the space of smooth loops. Uh, you have to have the loops with very mm -mm, non-singular behavior, which means. Uh, you know, it, it can be described by finite number of Fourier coefficients on that map of the circle. So, so it's not like a smooth map of the circle. That's the problem. Anyway, I'll, uh, maybe I'll write to you if I have any thoughts about. Yes, it. I, I would gladly discuss it. You, can you I have share plenty of unpublished things which may be useful if you want. I can discuss. Yeah, yeah Dennis, I can share them oh, with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one can ask an abstract question. I mean, suppose you have just forget the equation for a second. Suppose you have a motion of loops, right? Just 
the equation is the circulation is supposed to stay constant, but you could ask, when is this induced by a motion of points? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So this, this, is, this is a soft question. It's just you know, some category properties. Like, see, there's a natural circle action on a loop. Uh, these should be unparametrized loops, right? Right, right. And so they're, they're, they're canonically parametrized by their arc length. Mm -hmm. up to a rotation, right? So there's a natural circle action. So that's an mm -hmm. additional structure on the loop space. It has a natural circle action. And, uh, well, there's, you know, there's a whole field called spring topology where the algebraic topology of, of that space is discussed and lots of neat things are going on, so. Yeah. I worked on that 20 years ago and was motivated by thinking about Euler's equation because Euler's equation has all of this vorticity transport in it, you know, which is vorticity for me is just a big link. So it's slightly generalized, right? So it's in the loop space already. Yeah, actually, I mean, I was planning to to talk to you about this, it's it's just still sort of in its infancy, even in my understanding. So I was going to discuss it with you a little later on, but in any case, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, but you know, you can also take the point of view is we don't have to get back to the classical picture. I mean, we, and of course, you want to because of where you you grew up in grad school, but. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, no. My my goal is my goal is to to get away from that as far as possible, yet make contact with it when I think it should. Yeah. Okay. And, right. Right. Like yeah. Marco Polo, go off to China and then come back and, and be yeah. European. With what you think. Yeah. Okay. No, but I, I'm even I'm even less I'm even more radical. I would say. We should really just be studying the action not on points at all, but we should study the action on extended objects. Oh, that brings me to another thing, which we just never discussed with mathematicians. And I wish I would have discussed it with late Arnold, but if it was too late, we never intersected. But why don't I raise that now? There is a dynamics of the vortex surfaces. Euler dynamics in terms of vortex surfaces is a beautiful version of Hamiltonian dynamics. You could write action, and that has, action has geometric meaning. If you have a vortex surface, the action is simply the volume, three-dimensional volume swept by that surface in time evolution. So action is just like a, for the point, the action is a trajectory of forward line. So uh, for the surface, for the vortex surface, the action uh, is a, a three-dimensional volume swept by the surface. And then, uh, uh, you could write down two variables. There are two variables. There is a discontinuity of velocity parameterized by this gap gamma and the shape of the surface. So the gamma is like momentum, canonical momentum, and the shape of the surface is like canonical coordinates. And the Hamiltonian dynamics uh, is this just canonical dynamics in terms of this coordinate and momentum. And the Kelvin theorem uh, simply means that momentum is conserved. Uh, and uh, uh, I wrote down all these equations and, and studied that. And uh, there is some gauge invariance in this system because you could reparameterize the surface and the uh, dynamics is invariant with respect to that. So there are many interesting mathematical aspects there, which was never discussed with, uh, you know, mathematicians of, of your style, only with applied ones which were not interested in, in, in the Hamiltonian structure. So if you want, I could, I could present that and give you the uh, reference. Uh, okay, I would like to hear that. Yeah, so the, the surface dynamic, the vortex sheet dynamic as a Hamiltonian dynamic. I think I, I wrote that paper in 87. It was used for the, you know, for the numerical simulations of the surface because these equations are exactly, that Hamiltonian dynamics exactly satisfies the Kelvin theorem. So. There are no violations of conservation if you f find the uh, evolution of these mm, equations. So that's a very interesting mathematical structure in my view. Uh, but it, as a mathematical structure, it was never discussed. Uh, so I would love to maybe, I could give you a talk about the 
uh, vortex shift dynamics as the Hamiltonian uh, structure. I think that'd be a good idea. But, but can you do the same thing for curves? Can you do an analogous discussion for curves? Curves are much more trivial. Uh, no, no, because but, but points are very tri trivial, yet we discuss them all the time. So let's. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, can you do it for curves, whether it's trivial or not? Yes, of course. So what's the yeah. statement? What is the. What well, the, for the curve, the, the action is the area swept by the curve. Uh, when it evolves, and uh, and uh, then there is this, uh, uh, you could describe the uh, Hamilton, effective Hamiltonian, which is double integral over the curve. That you know, there is this formula for the potential of double uh, layer. Uh, it's called so the one-dimensional formula is just counter integral. So the Hamiltonian will double integral over the curves. Yes, it's what I'm doing is generalization of that very well-known formulas. People studied the formulas for the potential of, of, of the curve. If there is discontinuity on the curve, then the formulas are very well-known. For the surface, it's also well-known because it's called potential of double layer. Uh, if there's discontinuity, then you could write the velocity field, and then you could write effective Hamiltonian. And that, that part was never done, but, but... Can it be done? I did it in 87 and published. All right. So can you deduce the equation that Theo showed us in this way from an action principle? What equation? The Euler equation acting on the loop space. Oh, I can check that Euler equation is equivalent to the uh, equations coming from the variation of that action. I explicitly check, oh, check okay. that. Fine. Now, what's so Euler dynamics for the... I would like Surfaces. to see the reference for that. You, can you tell me? The, is that the 87 paper? Yes, but, but it was published in 88 with Augustine. The 87 paper is impossible to find, but the 88 surface paper is published uh, in, in journal nonlinear science or something, and I could give you the reference, yes. Oh, that would be great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then, then, okay, so you're up for next week. Okay. Me? Yeah. Oh, about this Hamilton, okay. Yeah, yeah, because this is just informal talking, right? I mean, you know, you don't have to. Prepare. Yes, I don't mind. Okay. You know it already. And a seal's going to talk in two weeks, right? Okay. So yes. we have yes. two weeks. This program is like a Broadway show. If we sell enough tickets, we're open. We stay open for two more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I ask one more question, Sasha? Um, yeah. About. Uh, this is something I, it, it's, it sounds kind of stupid, but I, I, I never could see how to do this. If, do you know, um, so, so in light of your loop space equation and it, the, the statement that the Kelvin theorem holds for, for a, any rectifiable loop, um, together with the fact that the flow that moves the circulation is generated by you know an incompressible velocity field um, that that, char that 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 characterizes the uh, incompressible Euler dynamics right it characterizes the the Euler solution so what I want to know is do you know any way to see just directly from the statement that the Kelvin theorem holds along any loop that the energy of the the uh, velocity field is conserved in time without oh, going you know, to the Euler no. Okay, that is what I will describe in the next uh, talk. I will describe the Hamiltonian dynamics from which you see all the conservation law. It's more than just energy. Energy is expressed in terms of its continuity. It's 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 complete two-dimensional Hamiltonian dynamics of which corresponds to three-dimensional potential flow with vertices shift. So it's not three-dimensional, it is two-dimensional. That's the beauty of it. And it is, oh yeah, all these conservation laws uh, follow from that. And Kelvin theorem means simply conservation of conjugate momentum conjugate to the shape of the loop. And that momentum is this, this, this circulation. Yeah, I think what you are asking is exactly what I am going to talk about. Okay. Good. You sound like a used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs>
we're all happy now, but we don't know what we're happy. We don't know why we're happy. <laughs> I'm happy because somebody is discussing things seriously with me. Nothing could make me more happy. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. Uh, right. See you next okay. week. We haven't quite okay. made three hours, you know. If we have four more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Lando seminar lasted forever. It could last for six hours. And I remember a seminar, a group of seminar, which was even worse than Lando seminar, which we did with Sasha Polikov. And we did it taking turns. Uh, we we're talking about the exact solution of the region to theory, which was anathema because they didn't believe that we could find that exact solution. So they, they objected and objected and objected. And then uh, I talked, then I got tired, Sasha started talking, he got tired, and I talked, and in the end, they just stopped. They stopped objecting. They kept silent. Ah. And we kind of left the ring uh, uh, undefeated. And that was the only case. But it took six hours. As you know, mathematicians cannot argue for six hours. Because, first of all, we decide what we're talking about. And then we both agree what we're talking about. And then it's either known, there's a counterexample, or it's not known, and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember the joke uh, which we once had in a joke with Sasha Polikov and Yasha Sinai when Sasha told me, mm, when we discussed that difference between mathematicians and physicists, there were good, uh, brilliant mathematicians in London. And Sasha said, you see, you see Sasha, mathematicians, uh, have their job is 10 times harder than yours with their all uh, rules and uh, you know, rigorous uh, statements. So if they prove the same thing as you, they must be 10 times smarter. And I said, but usually they uh, prove something which is not the same, which is less, like uh, 10 11. So, no, but it's of course unfair. Uh, it's of course unfair because I've seen so many examples of beautiful breakthroughs which came. So I know that mathematicians not only prove theorems but also solve equations. Because, for example, multi instant on solution was found by mathematicians, by Mann and, uh, and so on. And there are many, many examples. It's just, it's just that, uh, that we don't have a gift for, for proving theorems. That's why we are trying to solve equations. You know, once at IHES, I saw two synthesis being next to me, and they were arguing. And one said, "You can do this this way, da da da," and the other one said, "No, no, no, you cannot treat that theory in that explicit way." And then they argued. Okay, I didn't pay much attention. Then I noticed later in the afternoon they were at the blackboard. They were still in the classroom arguing. I went in and listened, and I watched them. And they were still arguing the same point. No, no, you can't do it. Yes, yes, I can do it. And I was, you know, I started asking little questions and I realized, I thought about it. I didn't sort of tell them this because it wasn't really polite or something, but they didn't understand the difference between if you have a vector space and a subspace, there are two things you can do. One, you can take an orthogonal complement to the subspace and the other, you can take the quotient by the subspace. And these, of course, are isomorphic. And what one physicist was saying, he can do it, and he was working on the quotient. And the other one was saying, you can't do it because he was trying to work in the orthogonal complement. Okay? Now, you can think that, okay, mathematicians are more rigorous in their details. That's not the point for me. For me, the point is there are concepts. One is the concept of a quotient vector space. We have that concept, it's non-trivial. It may sound trivial to you because you're used to it. I claim it's non-trivial to take a space, divide it into subsets and form a quotient space, which has one point for each subset. That's a non-trivial construction that we do without thinking. And many, here was two famous physicists and they did not understand that this concept was playing a role and it was, dividing, allowing them to argue for several hours. 
Yes, we shouldn't argue about such things, indeed. No, no, it's not that we shouldn't argue, but the, 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 what's missing is not, it's, it's, it's the lack of a, of, a, of a precise concept. It's not the details and rigor, it's the precision of a concept. This is well, I came to you guys to help me find such precise concepts. So I know what is missing. Of course I know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, the concepts usually come at the end after you understand everything, then you can make the right concepts. So it's sort of, it's, it's a dilemma. All right, I'm looking forward to next week. Don't forget okay. to send me the reference, please. Okay. Okay, I will send you a reference right away. This one, my. Okay. Okay, the big year. Bye. Bye, Raphael, bye. Bye, bye. bye. thank you. Okay. Ryan, are you still there? Oh, right. Yes. No, I'm here. Okay. You can hang around if you want. Okay, I'll stop the recording.